Good evening, everyone. We received the apology from Councillor Dingsdale, and it's been agreed that Councillor Saldin and Councillor Asga will be chairing the meeting this evening. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, fellow councillors, and welcome to the scrutiny panel of the Regeneration, Transport and Culture. Um, I'm going to start off with some opening remarks. So during the meeting, all participants will be in control of their own microphones. Please ensure you turn on your microphone when you are speaking, and remember to turn it off when you're finished. All reports will be published. All reports published as part of this agenda will be considered as read by members of the panel. Published reports will therefore be summarised to allow the panel to focus on questions. Uh, we have also received uh, a number of uh, members of the public who'd like to speak at this meeting. Those members of the public will be receiving three minutes' time to make their submissions. Uh, all the members of the public have notified me in advance of the meeting of their intention to speak. If they haven't, then uh, you, I presume there's no others who wish to let me know of their intention to speak. Um, I will be giving those members three minutes to speak. If you could please address the panel at that time. And uh, then uh, a three-minute warning will sound, and uh, you will have then 20 seconds to wind up. Um, I would now like to move on to the first item of business, which is apologies for absence. I've received apologies for absence from Councillor Lawrence Dingsdale, as Samantha has said, from Councillor Dave Sullivan, and from C Councillor Miranda Williams, and for lateness from Councillor Cathy Dowles. Uh, urgent business, I have not been notified of urgent business. Is there any urgent business that would like to be raised? Yeah, thank you, I see none. Declarations of interest. Members have been asked uh, if, well, do members have any other declarations of interest other than them which is already listed within the agenda? Uh, listed within the agenda is uh, an item on the Royal Greenwich Heritage Trust who will be making a presentation. It is listed on the agenda, but I'm just reminding members that I do sit on the board of the Royal Greenwich Heritage Trust, so I'll be recusing myself from item seven of this meeting, and Councillor Asgar will be taken over, as agreed. Uh, in terms of the minutes of the last meeting, are members happy to confirm that they are an accurate record of the meeting held on the 26th of October, 2023? Thank you, members. Right, we'll now move on to the first item of substantive business, which is the Visit Greenwich update. And I believe we are getting a presentation from Barry Kelly, the Chief Executive Officer for Visit Greenwich. Barry. Um, there's quite a lot of slides here, but I can go through them really quickly. I'm assuming you've, you've read them, they've been with you for a couple of weeks. So here we are, how we're set up, what our tourism plan is, what's been working well, how we've managed to balance the budget with the, uh, the cuts last year, and moving forward, what we see as the priorities and, and key challenges. Uh, next. Um, firstly, you know, why does tourism matter? Um, it brings in £130 billion pounds revenue to the, to the UK. It's our fourth biggest export. Uh, in Greenwich, that's about £1.4 billion at the moment. Uh, and again, it uh, generates about 3 million jobs uh, nationally, 17,000 in, in Greenwich. But it's not just about the money, it's about education, it's about image and soft power. Um, you know, good places to visit tend to be great places to invest and, and to live in uh, and to study. Uh, and also, generally, if you get the balance right, um, you can have better services for local people uh, by better services propped up through tourism revenue. Uh, we are a partnership between the Royal Borough of Greenwich and currently about 250 businesses. Uh, I haven't put them all on the, on the slide there, but to try to give you an idea about the range and depth clearly name, mainly tourism businesses, but sometimes education uh, and other businesses who think the Greenwich brand is, is relevant to them. If you move forward. Uh, we do six things. Um, destination marketing is probably the key thing, getting people to come here. Uh, visitor services, looking after people once they're here and moving people around. Uh, lobbying and trying to shape the place and influence future development. Uh, supporting our businesses and helping them to perform better. Uh, measuring everything and everything to death, which we do pretty well. And increasingly, we're involved in the skills agenda, which I'll talk about uh, later on. Next. So um, there's a separate plan here, which is a 50-page plan, which I'm not going to show you. You'll be pleased to know. Uh, but to give you an idea of the shape of it, uh, we launched this last summer, if you move forward. Uh, in terms of the shape of it, uh, we've, we've really built it around the, the customer journey. Uh, looking at every aspect of the customer journey, trying to enhance the experience at every point, uh, working with our partners. If you move on, so you can see the whole circle there. 
uh, and all the whole plan is built around from a customer perspective. Uh, next slide. The metrics are really important. I mean, the main metric is around uh, visitation and spend, and you'll see the top graph there is economic impact. The graph at the bottom is visitor numbers. Uh, we measure this through a model called STEAM, which I'm happy to answer questions on, uh, which has been used in the borough since 2007. You'll see there, if you look at the, the shape of the graphs, you'll see the impact of the pandemic, the colossal drop in visitation and revenue, and you'll see the recovery and I'm pleased to say the recovery is going a bit better than we thought. And when we get the 2023 figures in, in around February, I think we'll be virtually back up to pre-pandemic levels. So I think we're probably, probably about a year ahead of what we thought. Uh, next slide. Just a few examples of some successes. It's a destination level. That's attractions performance. The, the, the green line is, is, the, is this year, and that's obviously higher than the year before. Uh, attractions are about 19% up and we're currently about 6% less than 2019. So that's moving in the right direction. And if you look at the next hotel, it's probably hard to read, but hotel performance has probably never been better. Occupancy is over 80% and revenue per available room is at a record high. So the, the hotels are performing particularly well. Uh, next. This is just coming from London Partners, which is really good. Um, if you look at, I think this is from some MasterCard data. If you look across the whole of the 32 boroughs in London, um, they've mapped uh, visitor satisfaction. The green areas are the best performing areas. And you'll see that Greenwich is in there. It's hard to read, but I think we're number two of boroughs across the whole of London, I think just behind uh, Richmond. Uh, I'm not sure why Richmond are ahead of us, but it's good to be second. Uh, and that's, that's brand new data that's come in. Uh, this is some work we did last year, working with the council on high streets for all. Um, big successes around Diwali and, and Luna, where we're we're trying to improve seasonality and in the winter generate local tourism. So then, you know, in the summer we rely on tourists, but in the winter we rely more on local people. And that worked really well. If you look on the next slides, some of the impact there. So we brought, brought about 50,000 people into town centers who were not just looking at the, the World Heritage Site being lit up beautifully, but spending money in the town center and the market. Uh, next. You all know the state of the station at the DLR Cutty-Sark which isn't great, and um, we're still waiting for the final escalator to be um, repaired. But what we have been working on with TFL for quite some time is improving the welcome. Uh, all this imagery went in a few months ago, welcome to Cutty Sark, Maritime Greenwich World Heritage Site, and some beautiful images to try to make the station a bit more uplifting. Um, it's also been cleaned quite a bit. And then Woolwich Lakes, we worked with the council on this. We did a lot of marketing support on, on promoting the events program, uh, connecting the arsenal and the town centre. If you go next. And we, they've got some new assets and videos and which will help the future promotion of, of Woolwich once the funding is finished. You're going very quickly here, aren't you? Um, <laughs> if you go, yeah, and that's it, fine, if you move on. Um, enjoy the website. So Visit Greenwich is the shop window to the world about the reasons to visit. On the same booking engine, we built Enjoy Royal Greenwich, uh, working with the council. And this site is designed um, to work at a hyper-local level. So if you're in Woolwich or Eltham, it knows exactly where you are. And it gives you content based on, on geography. Um, it's very rich in high street data, which the visit site isn't. So this is something we want to build. And we're currently talking to a councillor, Lullivar, about how we can improve this and integrate it better with the, uh, the one card. Uh, moving on. Moving on. Uh, this is, I'm not going to go through the whole marketing um, uh, work we do if you go next, um, but we do measure this stuff very, very well, better than Visit England and Visit London in my opinion. Um, when we do campaigns, we measure things very, very carefully and um, our last campaign reached over half a million people and we can measure the ROI, which I'm happy to explain to you how we do it. Uh, and it generated 53 to one. Uh, that means every pound that we spend brings 53 pounds uh, into the borough, which is a very, very high uh, ROI and, and higher than national averages, uh, if you move on. Uh, corporately, um, obviously, post-pandemic, we're trying to build the business up again. If you move up, next slide. Um, our partnership levels are uh, uh, looking healthy. Recently, Alcatel joined. They want to tell their story. Uh, Zedwell Hotels is a new hotel. Uh, which has just come into Greenwich. Uh, we've won a few awards. On the left-hand side there, we won a, a travel, an international travel marketing award for the best digital campaign. Uh, this is a global award. Um, so we're really pleased to win that in the summer. And if you look on the right-hand side, 
we were just voted as in the top three DMOs in the whole country. That's destination management organizations. Um, there were about 150 in total, and we came in the top three. Unfortunately, we didn't win. Uh, that, that was won by Visit Kent. But there we are. Uh, next slide. So we launched our plan in the summertime. That was well attended. That was at Bureau in the Design District. Uh, if you move on. Uh, we do a lot of international work through travel trade. We attend World Travel Market, ITB Berlin. We went with Visit Britain to Destination Britain, North America. So we're promoting Greenwich um, globally, uh, particularly through our, our travel trade work. Uh, next. Increasingly doing a lot more work on skills, working particularly with um, the council, GLAB, uh, uh, LSEC, uh, the University of Greenwich and, and Ravensbourne to connect um, local people with with the with jobs. Um, so last week we had an event at Woolwich Works where we had 13 employers um, exhibiting to uh, 200 local people to create local jobs. If you move forward, challenges, uh, many challenges. But if you try to highlight the few, next. Uh, balancing the budget, we also had a huge funding cut last year. Um, which we're still uh, wrestling with um, as we recover from the pandemic. Uh, the way we did it is by increasing our membership fees. Uh, a few of our board members stepped up. We've reduced overheads, we've reduced staffing uh, through secondments, uh, and we've reduced our marketing expenditure. So most of our marketing now is fully funded through sponsors. We don't really have cash to put into that. If you move on next. Challenges, clearly Woolwich is a, is a huge challenge. Um, I think that Woolwich needs its own kind of marketing campaign to raise profile, which will help Punch Drunk and Woolwich Works. Greenwich Waterfront is our big place shaping scheme that we're talking to Mersad and, and Ryan uh, uh, about, developing a, a more connected waterfront. Obviously connecting local people to these jobs that we create. Um, there's talk about a tourism tax at the moment, uh, nationally, locally, and I think Andy Burnham is championing that. So I'm not sure though where that might head. And increasingly across the country, there are lots of new, new funding models being trialed, which I'll talk about on the next slide. So if you look at gross income, 85% 85 of our income now doesn't come from the council. Um, but. Uh, that isn't necessarily a good thing because commercial revenue is unstable and requires a lot of servicing. It's hard to build on, whereas the council funding gives us more stability. We're currently talking about new funding models, uh, and this is a conversation happening nationally. Uh, I'm a big fan of tourism bids and bids in general. Would they, you know, Visit Greenwich in the future could be a bid, or it could be partly funded by bids. And also, we're talking to the council about um, a new approach. You know, can Visit Greenwich do more uh, for the council, particularly on the, on the local agenda with the one card, uh, local events and, and local communications? I think that's it, if you are next. That's it. Questions, questions, please. Thank you very much, Barry, for that uh, comprehensive presentation. And thank you for coming to speak to us this evening. Uh, Panel members, I have a number of questions, but I see Councillor Hartley has got his hand raised, and has Councillor Hannan. So uh, I, I didn't see who put it up first. I'll. <laughs> Councillor Hartley, please go ahead. We're being too polite. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, your presentations always make me uh, uh, reflect on uh, you know when we've got a, uh, all these attractions that bring people from all the way around the world. Just how lucky we are to actually live here full time, 365 days a year. Um, thanks for the update. Um, a couple of questions. The first is uh, Woolwich Works. Um, could you, uh, you, you said, you know, Woolwich as a whole needs a marketing campaign. And when, when the council set up Woolwich Works, um, the phrase that I was told um, during scrutiny was, this is going to be the new South Bank. That was the uh, comparison that was made. And mm -hmm. we're very far short of that. Um, what would be your view? On, um, on what's needed and the scale of marketing campaign that would be needed to deliver mm -hmm. on that kind of aspiration. Okay. Um, well, I used to work very closely with James Heaton when he was brought on board, and I think it was part of the panel with I think Denise Highland and a few other people in that, and clearly was a very shrewd operator, but, but coming from West London. And I think he tried to bring in a West London model that maybe Woolwich wasn't ready for. Um, I think... Um, didn't really work particularly well in partnership with anybody. So um, the, new, the new regime who's come in, and I think it's Nick who's come in, uh, his, his model is entirely the opposite of the previous model, which I think is a good thing. Because first and foremost, Woolwich Works has to be a community resource. 
you have to give, give local people what they want. And if you can't excite local people, you're not going to bring people from all over the country, are you? So I think he, he seems to be doing that, and I've met him a couple of times, and I think his new approach is definitely the right approach. Um, I think with um, what we started with Woolwich Lates was trying to connect Punch Drunk, uh, Woolwich Works, and the Arsenal with the town centre. That was the, the plan, but not a huge amount of money to do that, but we've started the process. Um, but the marketing budget was like 20,000 quid. Now, if you want to promote Woolwich to the whole of London, for example, you know, um, you certainly need a six figure, so you certainly need over 100,000 pounds know, to do it well. So obviously the Elizabeth line is incredible. Um, and lots of demand will come naturally. But I think, you know, working with TfL and, and all the Woolwich stakeholders, we could quite easily put together a consortium and a campaign for about 100K, that kind of level. And I think that could have a big impact. So I think that's the scale of, of what's required. But I think the current approach under the new leadership is, is much, much better. Thank you. That's an extremely useful answer. And thank you for your candor as well. Um, could you just explain a bit about your current uh, work with Woolwich Works? So you've, uh, you've met, you've said you've met a few times. Is there any relationship between Visit Greenwich and, and the Trust or Woolwich Works on a formal basis or a commercial basis? Yeah, so Woolwich Works began, the, uh, James Heaton was on the board of Visit Greenwich and one of our 13 directors, uh, but before he left, he resigned from the board and for, for a few months, Woolwich Works was completely disengaged, but they're now back on board as a partner. Uh, they're paying in less than they used to do. We understand the challenges on their budget, and we're also, because I understand the, the significance of it and, and the long term, we've included them in our core campaigns for free, which normally would charge about 10K for. So I've included them for free because I know strategically how important that is. So they're back on board, uh, we're engaged, and we're currently marketing them to about, well, to about 10 million people in, in the southeast of England. Okay, good to hear. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, I, I suppose, could you just give us a bit of an insight into sort of penetration in the borough? So you, you've explained the consequence of the reduction in funding from the council, mm -hmm. and um, uh, I appreciate your point that um, commercial arrangements, memberships, all of that takes a lot of work, a lot of money, a lot mm -hmm. of um, resourcing, as you said, servicing. Um, are there, you know, major organisations, businesses in the borough that you that, that aren't uh, part of, uh, you know, your, um, you know, aren't kind of fully engaged in your work? Uh, have you got a hit list of organisations that you're struggling to engage? And is there more the council can do to help with that? Um, well, we've been doing this for eight, nine years now, and um, we've got a kind of a momentum and kind of a trust built up through track record. And um, there isn't anybody obviously missing around the table. There's the odd hotel, but some of the hotels are difficult, particularly the um, you know, the chains like Travel Lodge, who have national policies not to join anything. So there's nobody obvious. Um, what we've been trying to do is get the current partners to move up up a level. So. In response to the funding cut last year, quite a few partners, such as the University of Greenwich, AEG, uh, the Old Royal Naval College particularly, really stepped up you know, big time and helped to fund probably half the gap. Um, so it's more really, I think, about getting current partners to do more. I mean, we can always bring in new partners, but I think retaining and, and working with what we have, uh, it's not really about, we don't really want we're not a chamber of commerce. We don't want hundreds and hundreds of people giving us 50 quid. We want to work with the people who can create the wealth and create the jobs. That's what it's about. And so to be honest with you, we can always have a bit of help, but there's nobody obviously who, who isn't really engaged. Thank you. And just a final question for me is um, just before the pandemic, um, there was um, some concern around sort of visitor numbers at the time. And I remember a presentation explaining that actually there's been an increase from North America, uh, from uh, tourists from uh, the United States in particular. Is that something that we've seen return since the pandemic? Um, is, that, is there more we can be doing to, to market in North America? Well, we can always do more, but the thing is marketing um, in North America is uh, expensive. So what we do is we work with UK inbound and visit Britain and sometimes visit London. And we go to the main, you know, the main trade shows. So we do what we can. Um, but clearly, um, a lot of the heavy lifting for international work is done by Visit Britain uh, and London Partners, where we do more domestic. Um, the, Amer the Americans are coming back, um, and they're virtually back up to where they were in terms of pre-pandemic levels, and they're also the biggest spending tourists by a long way. Uh, 
the Chinese market is tipped to return by 2026. That isn't necessarily gr big for Greenwich. Um, the Meridian line does pretty well out of it, but that's probably it. But for London, uh, the Chinese market is it's a big spend market and that will re return in a couple of years. But what's happened differently this year is that the domestic uh, market's been really strong and, and Greenwich Peninsula for the first time ever is actually outperforming Maritime Greenwich. So North Greenwich Pier is busier than Greenwich Pier and that's never happened and it's because they're powered by a local economy and the South East England economy. Um, so the O2 and the cable car and the whole Night Dragon um, portfolio is, is doing particularly well. Uh, that's what's changed since the pandemic. Fascinating. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Hannan. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation, which I found really interesting. Um, you presented some really great statistics at the beginning about benefits of tourism yeah. for, for uh, residents and jobs. Um, and obviously it would be great to have those benefits across the borough rather than mm -hmm. concentrated in specific areas. And although I accept that some parts of Greenwich are going to attract more tourism, it's mm -hmm. really interesting what you were saying that local tourism, mm -hmm. particularly in the winter, has yeah. been you've been focusing on that. So I'd be interested in understanding what you're monitoring in terms of visitors and where they're going and why they're going there and whether we're tracking who's visiting where and for what reasons and whether we can then start to encourage more, yeah. at least local tourism yeah. in areas that have, are traditionally not yeah. attracting people and what yeah. we can do to kind of support those areas to, to bring in those, those, those tourists more or local people as tourists more. So on data, I think data is the best thing that we do because our partners share with us real commercial data. So I get data from all the transport operators, all the hotels, all the attractions, I get the council data from town centres, we get car park data, and we analyse it to death, we aggregate it, and we kind of try to build a, build a picture about what's happening. We, we, we profile kind of everything, so we're kind of very, very data rich. So I'm, I'm pretty confident we, we are measuring um, everything um, to the best that we, we, we can do. I, I'd like to have better information on, on spend data, and there's talks about working more with MasterCard or Visa uh, to do that, but we're not there yet. In terms of kind of spreading the benefits of tourism, um, I think you have to be realistic. It depends on what market you're going for. If you're going for the North American market, then it's Maritime Greenwich primarily. If you're going for the Southeast uh, of, 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 um, of England, then it can be, can be everything. Um, you know, it's, it's unlikely that the American tourists are gonna go to Elton Town Center, but the high likely to go to Elton Palace. So we, you know, we do, we do try to spread everybody around. Our, our itineraries showcase the whole of the borough. But the benefits are not just um, about spread, making tourists move around the borough. Uh, the benefits are around jobs and wealth creation because um, there, are, there, are, there are jobs available from the spend for everybody in the borough. And that's what we're trying to do, that, you know, working with GLAB and LSEC particularly to make sure that the local people are kind of first in the queue to get the opportunities rather than having to kind of you know, kind of import people from all over the world. So, so there are different ways of spreading the benefits. Um, but yes, there are, I mean, the main honeypot is Maritime Greenwich. Greenwich Peninsula is the other honeypot. Woolwich is def definitely emerging as, as a cultural creative uh, district. Uh, and also then there are other kind of hidden gems around from Eltham and parts of Blackheath. And so we're very mindful of that. And we do, if you go to our tourist information center or our website, you'll see that we, we promote everybody. And we don't, it's not just people who pay us, we promote people that don't pay us. So I promote a lot of people who don't pay us, like Seven Drew Castle and people like that, because I know it's important. Councillor Asgar. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Barry, for your presentation. It's really informative. Um, I, first of all, I have a message from Councillor Miranda Williams, who's not with us here tonight. She's a member of this panel, and you, you all know Miranda, because she's do. on your board. And she yeah. would like me to tell you that I think they are brilliant and well worth the money and achieve more than the sum of their pots. I, I didn't pay to say that, but it's always good to hear. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, my question is um, on challenges. Mm -hmm. um, and East Bank, 
which has um, East Bank in Stratford, the big sort of arts district that's yeah. open there or is opening there with lots of sort of anchor tenants like the V&A, mm -hmm. East, um, BBC, London College of Fashion, things like that, um, very much trying to make it a destination. Do you, do you see East Bank as, um, I'm going to say in the nicest way possible, a, a threat to people coming to Greenwich that they'd rather go to um, East Bank instead than come to the museums here, etc.? It's a good question. I can't really answer it too well because I don't really know much about it. I'm actually, but I'm actually there on the, this weekend. I'm actually going as a tourist. <laughs> I'm going to Greenwich and, and there. So um, I think we, we look at Greenwich with kind of soft edges and because quite a lot of tourists don't really know what council boundary is and what it isn't. And probably 10% of our partners technically aren't in, in, in Greenwich. So we, we do work with um, definitely, you know, the Royal Docks area, Canary Wharf, uh, parts of Lewisham. So I kind of, where it makes sense, we kind of, um, Benef we can work with people on, on the edge. So, for example, um, the reason the hotels are doing so well is because of XL. You know, XL is performing really well, and that powers a lot of business for Greenwich hotels. So, we probably need to reach out and do more with, with them. Uh, I need to see it myself. I've not, I've not seen it yet. Um, but but um, potentially, it's a threat. Potentially, yeah. But we could maybe collaborate with them. Thanks very much. Um, I'd like to ask. It's more of a. Um I don't know if it's a TFL question, but um, is the Green Chain Walk on your radar at all? Is it something that you um, promote? Uh, part, I mean, the Green Chain Walk is obviously all around London, but we have a lot of it in, in the borough, um, and it is a way of going from the west to the east of, of our borough as well. I mean, there's some great green spaces in the east. Um, is that something that you focus on? What's it called? The Green Chain Walk. It's um, sort okay. of, you can basically walk, you know, through greenery throughout, okay. throughout London, really. I haven't, I haven't heard of that. Yeah, no, um, that's okay. Well, the, the, the whole idea of Greenwich Waterfront, which is our big play-shaping uh, project, is to, is to really connect the waterfront so that maritime Greenwich and the peninsula, and then Woolwich, and then further east, can be better connected in terms of, you know, physical connection uh, with river, you know, cycling, walking, running, and everything. So it's, it's, it's seamless and joined up. So we're talking to, to Ryan and Merced and, and his team about how we can align all the development to make sure that individual decisions are made that actually present the waterfront as a whole. Because I think that whole kind of experience where you can bring together the whole, bring east and west, is actually would be a great thing for local people. And it would be a great thing to, to, for tourism uh, because you'd bring the two Greenwiches together better. Uh, and then obviously then further east and I think the, the waterfront is the largest waterfront in the whole of London that Greenwich has and I think um, I think there's massive potential to do more so I think I think the, the only the, the area we are most involved in is around that kind of waterfront concept I know which doesn't include everybody like in the south but actually it's picking up our three key destinations along, along the river and, and that's really what we're trying to sh help and shape so that eventually in 10 years time uh, it's all joined up that's wonderful to hear. It, it would be it would be a, a great experience to do because it's quite frustrating when you walk across. It's quite fragmented, isn't it? In parts. Yeah. Well, it, it, in other parts of London, when you yeah. walk along the riverfront and yeah. then it's gated, it's private, and then you have to yeah. go inland yeah. and you can't actually walk along the river. We, well, so. we've written a, a kind of a strategy in the paper for that, and, and Sean Collins from Uberbow by Thames Clippers is helping, and we met with the, the council team a few weeks ago to talk through it, and um, it, it isn't really about. It's more about uh, alignment and joined up thinking more than anything else. So uh, we're, we're moving in. It, it will take quite a long time. Sure. That's great. Thanks very much, Barry. Thank you. Councillor Dowes. Thank you. Sorry I missed the presentation, but I did read it. It was really interesting. <laughs> um, I just wanted to ask why um, more isn't made of the fact that we are a world heritage, or Greenwich is a world heritage site. I hadn't even realised until quite recently when I bought a book on world heritage sites and saw Greenwich in it and ticked it off and thought, OK, I've been there. So okay. um, I just wondered why we didn't make more of that, really. I think we make, we make a lot of it and we do a lot with it. And um, uh, it's the, probably the core, the core of uh, what, we, what we lead everything on. And um, I mean, there are four world heritage sites in, in London and, um, you know, it's uh, all on the river. It, it's really, really important. We work very closely with the World Heritage Site Executive. Uh, I, sit on, I sit on there. 
their group and, and their chair sits on visit Greenwich Board, you know, Paddy Rogers. You'll have seen the, the images at the um, DLR station. It's never ever said before, uh, welcome to Maritime Greenwich World Heritage Site. So it now says UNESCO World Heritage Site. Also, there's a, there's a massive um, uh, sign now next to the Cutty's Ark that says World Heritage Site, UNESCO World Heritage Site. So um, I think you're seeing probably more of it. Um, but people, uh, it's not essentially um, a brand in that um, people don't necessarily visit places because of the World Heritage Sites. It's more of a kite mark. It's more of a kind of a reassurance. You know, they come to Greenwich to do the great things in Greenwich. The fact it's a World Heritage Site is kind of reassuring. Um, it's different in Europe where people kind of go around with a bucket list. But in this country, it's not, not quite the same. Um, but there are other World Heritage Sites in London. So the Tower of London, they don't even mention they're a World Heritage Site at all. So, so, we, so we, we do, and we see, that we see the power of it and the, the value of it, and we're doing quite a lot with it, really. Thanks, I shall look out for it more in yeah. the future. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Uh, on to my questions now. So I did notice uh, from your presentation that a lot of it is actually east-west along the river, and I can understand that with yeah. you know, Maritime Greenwich, the peninsula, and uh, the heritage around Woolwich, but as a raw borough, we do extend a fair amount south as well. Yeah. Um, would you be able to tell us a little bit around uh, some of the activities that are going towards the south of the borough and any opportunities that you know we might not think of as necessarily tourist stuff that, uh, that mm. you know we might be able to leverage more? Yeah. Well, so our main partner in the south would be English Heritage, you know, through Elton Palace. So we we work very very closely with them. You know, they're engaged in all our working groups. So we, we promote them uh, as a standalone attraction, um, and we also include them in itineraries uh, as part of the rest of uh, Greenwich. So in terms of promotion, they've always been from the beginning quite high up, uh, I would say. Um, I think the town centre is more difficult uh, to connect. I think the travel um, is, is an issue, isn't it, between uh, north and south. In general, it's, it's quite difficult to kind of get between north and south. Um, so... We're doing we're doing what kind of what we can. But if you look at what we put, if you look at our website, you look at if you go to the tourist information centre, um, we have as much information around the south of the borough as we have as we can have really. So it's um, we're, we're doing what we can, but the basically there's less product there for tourists. Um, that's the main thing. But the enjoy initiative I talked about uh, is probably a better alternative there. So I think generating more local tourism. It's probably uh, easier than trying to get American kind of a tourist. So the Enjoy Royal Greenwich platform is there for local people. And if we can get the one card up a level and integrate it better, we can connect human communities and businesses better and get more flow. So the, the engine room that we built is really, I think, Enjoy as opposed to Visit, because Visit's like the shop window, but Enjoy is very much around the kind of more local. So... Um, so we are we are doing what we can, and um, and I don't think we're missing anything. We've got you know we include everybody you know the you know Tudor Barn and the um, Seven Drew Castle, and we have, we have events at Seven Drew. We've helped them a lot, particularly even though they, we know they're quite um, cash strapped because I know it's important. So we're we're doing what we can, but you know, we can always probably do more. Great, thank you. Uh, my next question is around that kind of destination and enjoy, so the participation side of things. So I'm aware we've got, say, in Elson, we've got the, uh, Royal, is it the Royal Blackheath Golf Club? Yeah. And we've also got Blackheath Rugby Club and Charlton yeah. Athletic, obviously. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. Down by the river. Yeah, yeah. Could you tell me a little bit about any tie-ins that we do with those organisations to cross-promote? Yeah. Charlton Athletic, Blackheath. What was the other one? The Rugby Club. Uh, okay. Well, it was the Rugby yeah, Club, yeah. yeah. So um, I was with Charlton Athletic this afternoon before I came here. Um, they're on board as, as partners of, of Visit Greenwich, and we're doing a lot of work with them, particularly on the university and uh, the Chamber of Commerce. So Charlton are very much engaged and we're helping th them to sell hospitality better and also to sell match tickets better and to give a better Greenwich welcome to, to fans who are going to matches. So Charlton are very much engaged and on board. The golf club has been in and out over the years in terms of being on board with us, but through the Chamber we've worked quite closely with them. So every year we have an annual golf day uh, with the chamber, so unfortunately, I have to I have to play I have to play golf one, once a year, 
on a very long and very hot course. So we work with the chamber and, and we promote that and we get um, lots of local businesses using the, the golf club. And, uh, and Blackheath Rugby, they're, um, they're members of Visit Greenwich. We've done uh, quite a bit of work with them o over the years. And we actually sell, not a lot, but we sell some of their merchandise in the um, tourist information centre. So you can buy Blackheath Rugby shirts and things. But, but obviously they're, um, they're more of an amateur club, aren't they? They haven't really em embraced the um, professional era as such. But I know historically they're the oldest rugby club, I think, in, in the country, I think. So we're engaged in all three in different ways. Great, thank you. Uh, that's reassuring to hear. Uh, the last question is actually in kind of two parts. Uh, you mentioned new funding models, including potentially a tourist tax in your slides. I was just wondering if you could provide some details about what you're looking at and how okay. that might work. Well, the, if you're looking across the country, if you look at the rest of London, for example, um, the equivalents of Visit Greenwich would be, say, the West End Development Company, South Bank, and the City of London Corporation. Uh, the West End Development Company and the South Bank are both set up as business improvement districts, as in bids. So they don't have voluntary members. They have a levy on uh, business rates, which they ring fence, and that goes into the development and promotion of that area. City of London is purely public sector, and we're the only what's called a DMO, as in the model that is mainly across the country, which is membership-based, which is voluntary. Um, if you go across the country, bids are coming into destinations and tourism more and more. So, for example, in Manchester, part, part of what Manchester does is funded through a, an accommodation bid, which helps them to generate conference business. Places like the Isle of Wight are purely a bid, so they don't have members, it's done through business rates. So what you're seeing spring up is, is that bids, VMOs are kind of coming closer together. Sometimes it's the same thing. Sometimes you have better cooperation. So in future, Visit Greenwich could cost the council nothing if it was a bid, a tourism bid, or it was partly funded through bids rather than the council and, and through membership. So I think, I think our model is, I don't think moving long term is going to be sustainable. I think we're having to look at something you know, quite, quite differently. Tourism tax is something very different. Tourism tax is being driven uh, more nationally. Um, and I know the, the GLA are currently looking at it, but what people don't know is, is that how are they going to raise it? It's probably going to be on hotels. And that means that probably wouldn't raise much for Greenwich because we're not really a hotel-led destination. But secondly is, what are you going to do with the money? Where is it going to go? Is it going to go into kind of gen generic stuff like, like policing and, and cleaning, or will it come back into tourism and culture? So that's the discussion that's happening at the moment. Um, and there are, I think nationally, the government are against it, but locally, lots of local places are for it, like Manchester and Cornwall and Liverpool. I'm not sure, well, I think London are for it uh, to a degree. But the question is, what's it for? Who does it go to? So the, the bid thing and tourism tax are very, very different. But I think the idea is, is that um, voluntary membership and council funding doesn't appear to be the long-term solution uh, for places, and people are slowly moving away from that kind of approach. And that's something we're kind of, we're kind of talking to the council about, really, about you know, different ways of doing things you know, in the future. So with a business improvement district uh, move, uh, so I'm going to pick, say, the Peninsula and yeah. the O2 as an example and the shops around that. Would there be any barriers to implementing that uh, in that, say, specific example? Well, they probably don't need it because of um, how they're set up with Night Dragon and AEG. Um, it's probably Greenwich Town Centre and Woolwich Town Centre and Eltham that, that probably need it. I think the Peninsula is probably the one area that doesn't need it. So um, I know the feasibility work done by the council through Savills was looking at uh, Woolwich and Greenwich as, as, as the possibles. And I don't think Peninsula... Um, necessarily is kind of it's well funded already and I think there's talk about maybe a creative enterprise zone being set up as well so I think the bid probably isn't for that part of Greenwich so are there any barriers around a business improvement district and the money you raise within that area through your levies that has to be spent within that area or is there well, other opportunities to spend that in the wider area that are contributing to the support of that very hyper-local bit of economy? Well, the biggest barrier is, is that the businesses have to vote for it. So basically, you can't impose it on a, a business area. You define an area, and you try to identify what the problem is you're trying to solve. And then there's like a vote, and it's done on kind of floor space. 
So um, you tend to find that lots of independent small businesses want it. Some of the bigger players don't want it. But you have to get 51% approval. Um, then that goes through on, on a vote. Um, councils tend to administer the bid. They tend to be four or five years long, usually 1% increase on... Is that working? No. Sorry, we seem to be ah. having some issues with the microphones. Um, it's back on again. So, um, and then that area decides what they want to spend the money on. So, it could be to do with um, public realm, cleaning, safety, uh, lighting, marketing, events. They're all different. Everywhere's different. I think that in London, there are about 30 of them. I think in Birmingham, there are 22. They're all, they're all in different shape. It depends what, what the businesses think the problem is in that area they're trying to solve. And they tend to work better when they're fairly small and really, really focused on, on, on the, doing a few things really well, rather than trying to be everything. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, before I'm going to move to Councillor Hartley, uh, I'm not sure when we've got you coming back in to speak to us again, but if you could include, and if we could minute this as a request, please to include some detail around the progress towards alternative funding arrangements uh, and how that was progressing for uh, their next briefing to us. Thank you, Samantha. Councillor Hartley. Thank you, Chair. Um, you read my mind. I think it was actually sort of a related point, which is I wonder whether we ought to ask council officers to um, appear, if that's feasible within the work programme, about the bid specifically. Um, there was mention of the feasibility study, and I'm, I'm, I think it's something a worthwhile, especially after that really productive, valuable exchange, it would be a worthwhile issue that we might look at from the council's perspective rather than just visit Greenwich's. Yeah, thank you. I think that's a great suggestion. Uh, Samantha, could we minute that as an action for Councillor Dingsdale to take when she returns to the chair? Thank you. And I had just one question, if I may, Chair, uh, just to, that's been prompted. Thank you. You've mentioned a couple of times about the one card, and you said you're in conversations with the Council about whether Visit Greenwich can take yeah. um, a, a, a role in that. Yeah. Could you just elaborate a little bit? Is that something that's actively being discussed? And yeah. more, and more yeah. generally, is there anything that you need from the Council that you're not getting? Pretend they're not in the room. Apart from money. Um, money. <laughs> the, um, now the one card, we're, we have a meeting actually on Monday with um, Councillor Oliver and, um, and Councillor Carey. Um, the, the one card as it stands, I know the reasoning to try to combine everything into one card for libraries, um, gyms and business, but it doesn't work, well, it doesn't work for the, for the business part. Um, it probably does work for the libraries element because you need to have some plastic and some ID and, but it, as a business engagement tool, it doesn't work because the, the branding and the technology of the platform it's on is really clunky. If you're a business who wants to put an offer on there, it's a bit of a challenge. And if you're a, a customer who wants to redeem an offer, it's a bit of a challenge. So we've got a pre presentation to go through on Monday to talk about how the Enjoy site can be developed to take on board the third element of that. So with a, with a few tweaks to the system, we can make it really easy for a business to promote itself and an offer and through probably using QR technology, which is really, uh, has stayed because it works, um, uh, make it really easy for, for local people to redeem offers. And because the site has got, it costs 30K to build using ARG funding uh, during the pandemic, because it's got the technology in that based, bases around, um, around geography, it can be hyper-local. So if you're, in, if you're in Plumstead, for example, it can target you around where you are. It won't be trying to sell you something in Maritime Greenwich where you aren't. So we think that is an engine room to help improve local promotion between businesses um, and local people doing more. Because at the moment, on the one card, I think there are about 20 odd offers on there or something. And it, I, think, I think that the technology is a barrier. So we, anyway, that's, the, that's where we're at anyway. Thank you. I like the sound of that. And also relates to your point, Chair, about extending ben benefits of all this to the south of the borough. And I can imagine that hyper-local element sounds yeah. really, really valuable. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Barry? Oh, sorry, Councillor Rasgar. Hi, Barry. Um, you mentioned that the all sponsors have uh, sort of stepped in and um, helped to fill the funding gap. Um, how sustainable is it? Have you got sort of long-term agreements with them, or is it ad hoc? Um, it's not ad hoc. It's uh, it's, it's yearly yearly agreements. Um, I think we have some stability around the Visit Greenwich board because we've got 13 businesses there involved at the highest level on 
terms of shaping our work. So there, there is um, th there's some stability there. It's when you go down the food chain, there's a lack of stability because the commercial income, the more you go down the food chain, is it, we spend more time raising the money and servicing the money and doing business support than doing the things we'd like to do, which is around shaping the destination. That's the problem. Um, so I don't think we can raise membership income much more. We increased our fees by 10%. That's the first time we've ever done it. And that's stuck. There are a few wobbles, but it's stuck. We can't really go back and do much more on that. So I don't think the only way we can grow as we are is probably through marketing consultancy and, and doing more. Kind of, so we do quite a bit of work for Greenwich Market at the moment as, as consultants, and, and that pays some money. But membership, it, it's really, there aren't, many, there aren't any obvious members we don't have. They're all paying quite a lot. They've all just put the, we put the fees up. I don't really think we can go much further in that territory. And we can't really lower costs more apart from removing people. Um, and our net marketing budget is now zero. It was, used to be like 100 grand. So um, I think the future has got to be around different fund, fund, funding models that we've, we've talked about. Um, or potentially visit range being more like tourism consultants and charging for their time and expertise, hopefully. Uh, but the membership model is really maxed out, really. Thank you. Great. Any other questions from the panel? No, great. Well, thank you very much, Barry. And we look forward to your next update. Thank you. Have a good evening. Right, the next item we have on the agenda is item number six, the transport strategy update, uh, which will be presented by Ryan Nibs, uh, Ryan Bunce, and Councillor Avril Lacau. Whilst the cabinet member and officers are getting themselves ready, I'll notify the panel that we have had four requests for additional speakers on this item. Uh, Sally Hughes from Greenwich Gone Too Far, Neil Robertson from Greenwich Cyclists, Eleanor Restall from the West Charlton Residents Association, and uh, Joe Jeffrey. I'm not sure which organization you're from, Joe, if you're here. Oh. One Greenwich. Oh, lovely, thank you. Uh, thank you, welcome. Um, do you want to turn your... Thank you, thank you. Right, uh, I'll let you uh, start us off, thank you. I'll start, thank you, Chair. Um, I think we're just almost a year on now from the introduction of the uh, transport strategy, which was introduced following the um, climate emergency, the declaration of a climate emergency, um, and then the carbon neutral plan, and uh, subsequently leading to um, the ident identification of the fact that 30% of our emissions, or 31% of our emissions, were transport, and so transport was a second largest emitter of carbon, um, and therefore it seemed really key that we t challenged that and we um, took some steps to address that. And that led to the consultation of the transport strategy, which was eventually um, passed. Now I'm going to assume that our members have read this um, update so I'm quite happy to go through the various areas or just take it straight to questions as we have many representations today. Uh, thank you. I was expecting a presentation from yourselves. Do you want to do the represent? Thank you. And who will be taking us through that? You can. Great. Thank you, Ryan. So uh, what we'll be doing is uh, you'll have a presentation for us just on some of the highlight level contents of the report. Uh, members of the public, I requested this from the officers in recognition of the fact that we had a large number of interested members of the public attending. Uh, what they've done is they've taken their report and they've summarized it, and I think Ryan Bunce, who's our transport strategy manager, will be taking us through that. Once we've done that, if I could ask the panel if there are any questions or clarifications that we have specifically on the proposal uh, that we think would be helpful for us to help understand that and the context for it, if we could raise that. I will then call on the members of the public who have asked to speak 
to make their presentations, for which I'll allow them thir uh, three minutes each, uh, which will be timed by my stopwatch here, and then uh, taking those comments on board if officers would then be able to come back and respond to that. I do remind uh, any interested parties here that this is a review of the overall transport strategy and as a panel, that is something we're interested in. We recognize there may be specific issues, but it's important for us to maintain a balanced view within the time available to ensure we're covering scrutiny of the entire transport strategy update has been provided to us. Thank you. Ryan. I'll start talking while the slides emerge. Um, if you wouldn't mind just holding on, if we yep. bring those up, I think it might be helpful for us to... Uh, I have a question, Chair, that can fill the time. Is it compulsory to be called Ryan in the Transport Department, and doesn't it, doesn't it get confusing? It is one of the prerequisites, <laughs> you, you say confusing, Casa Hartley. It, it Some saves of us find it quite me from convenient. remembering too many names. Thank you. I think uh, similar names from our people presenting might be a theme of this evening, but I won't spoil <laughs> the surprise for you. Um, thank you. Um, as Councillor Lacalle said, the transport strategy was adopted uh, around a year ago, um, and this report gives an update on the progress across that strategy. Um, as has been said, we we'll assume people have read the details, but to go through some of the highlights, um, the strategy is our medium to long-term approach to all transport issues across the whole borough. Um, and it, if we, perfect. Um, it identifies a number of themes and objectives that help us create a kind of step change in travel behaviour required to meet the carbon neutral plan and our Greenwich objectives. Um, the first of those is a healthier Greenwich, which is about you know, making transport work for people's health and not damage it. Uh, safer Greenwich, um, cleaner, greener in terms of reducing emissions and being climate resilient, um, ensuring we support prosperity and keep people and goods moving efficiently and making it a great place to be in terms of technology, technology connectivity, sort of moving things forward. Um, in terms of the progress to date, important to note that we're one year in. A lot of the product, projects that have been shaped by the transport strategy uh, start, in start and are funded in financial years. So for some of those, we're six or so months in. So a lot of the things here are things that are in progress that are moving us towards those goals rather than having loads of stuff completed in the first 12 to six months, depending on how you measure it. Um, the f and we're gonna run through a, a list of the highlights. The first of these is um, emission-based parking charges. Um, so, f which since uh, 24th of July, um, parking charges have been based on vehicles' carbon emissions, which should help to encourage lower emissions, cleaner, safer vehicles. Um, the DLR and bus rapid transit to Thamesmead, there's actually been a slight development in, well, quite a significant development in this since we submitted the paper and this update in that the autumn statement allocated 23 million pounds for bus rapid transit from Woolwich to Thamesmead to Abbey Wood, which is one of the key first bits of development in Thamesmead and Beckton Riverside, um, which we really welcome, but still pushing to secure the funding for the Docklands like railway extension that kind of really allows that area to be opened up and deliver the full benefits. Um, on to parking design. I'm not going to go through this long list in detail, but there are, I think, two controlled parking zones that have been in place, two that are in kind of late stages of development, and three that are in the earlier stages of development. So quite an acceleration in the pipeline of controlled parking zones. Um, the West and East Neighbourhood Management Scheme. Um, we, within the, yeah, within the last year, we completed the stage one consultation, went out to a second stage two consultation um, in the autumn, which we had a really good response to. The response to that's being analysed and informing a decision um, on what options we take forward following the consultation, um, which is anticipated shortly and depending on the options selected, you'd expect implementation towards the end of the financial year. 
Um, related to that, there's a traffic management and school streets prioritization matrix project, which is looking at where across the borough we need traffic management and school street schemes based on a wide range of data. Um, we've got consultants crunching a lot of numbers from that, starting to see some outputs, and towards the end of the financial year, we hope to be able to share what the outcomes of that are, and where we can, you know, where we want to be going first. Um, cycle network development um, is three schemes primarily that we're working with Transport for London to develop through their cycle network development funding stream. Um, so that is kind of a state a series of stages you have to go through to eventually secure their funding for larger cycle network schemes. So there's Greenwich Town Centre interim connection, connecting up the cycleways either side in advance of uh, Greenwich Town Centre Liverpool neighbourhood wider scheme. Um, Elton to Greenwich and Shooters Hill to Greenwich. Um, they're all kind of being developed towards consultation um, in kind of the end of this month, beginning of the new year now. Um, before decisions at the end of the financial year on how they're taken forward. Um, there's a smaller kind of borough funded and promoted Plumstead to Abbey Wood cycle route, which we're working on. Um, we've had feedback from members and the public, and we've collected more data to shape some revised proposals. Um, EV charging, um, following the electric vehicle strategy that accompanied the transport strategy, we're working on a innovative licensing based approach to getting more EV chargers into the borough. We think that's going to be the best way to rapidly accelerate and have a big step change in electric vehicle charging provision across the borough. Um, we're after a lot of input from procurement colleagues and legal, we're kind of getting towards the end of preparing a decision for how we take that forward, which will be really exciting. Um, street lighting, um, which comprises technology to dim the street lights and the replacement of the bulbs with LEDs, which are lower energy, um, are very nearly complete. I think there's a f small number of kind of schemes being completed there, but they're substantially there. Um, dockless bikes, um, similarly to EV charging, we've kind of done a lot of work to find an approach that's going to work for the borough for that. We've done some member workshops, actually happened now, um, and we're hoping for being ready for a decision soon. Um, 20 mile an hour roads, another really long one that I won't go into detail, but I think consultation on two and a program for following up. Um, highways contract um, for the provider of all our highways and maintenance works. Um, uh, decisions anticipated in January for that, which will allow award before the end of the financial year. Um, new contract to be in place for the new financial year. Um, the school streets program is for uh, the 11 current school streets um, to be made permanent and upgraded to camera enforcement, which allows more flexibility and emergency access. Um, and we'd look to consult in the new year and those be in place in the new form from spring. Uh, Greenwich Town Centre, Liverpool Neighbourhood, I touched on before the interim scheme. This is the longer term scheme to transform the Greenwich Town Centre, looking at removing the gyratory. Um, we think we've kind of agreed with TfL what's required to get the scheme up to the next gate stage and secure the next bit of funding, and kind of commissions are rolling to do that. Um, Plumstead Public Realm Improvement Project is another one where there's been a development since report and slides in that the consultation is now live um, and up online. I encourage anyone interested in that area to have a look. Um, this is one where I'm definitely not going to read it all out, um, but it covers our bus aspirations. Um, the mayor announced the Superloop network of express bus services, which has got some good benefits for the borough, uh, particularly the edges of the borough, and included eventually an extension to uh, from Abbey Wood to Thamesmead, which is really helpful, um, but it doesn't go far enough. Um, we've been working hard with TfL, and all three of us have met with the senior executive there to discuss ways forward, and we've identified ways forward for another key trans key, key public transport issues listed there. So those are the key areas of progress, and we're happy to take any questions.
Uh, thank you. So just to remind members, if there are specific clarifications on this, uh, please do that. But if we could reserve any other questions for after we've heard evidence from the others. Councillor Hartley, you have a question? Uh, apologies. I've got some questions on the report, and I'm very mindful of your advice that we're focusing on, on policy and strategy as opposed to specific schemes. Do you, uh, if I've got questions on what we've just heard, is now the moment to ask them, or do you want me to wait till later? I'm happy uh, to. I, I'd leave that up to you. I'm flexible, if nothing else. Uh, but I think some of the comments that we might be receiving may relate to those schemes. So I just wanted to... I'm happy to hold my questions for later, if thank that's you. helpful. Thank you. Are all other members agreed with that? Great, thank you. Uh, thank you. If you don't mind just stepping away, and I'll call the people who've asked to speak. Uh, first up, could I have Sally Hughes from Greenwich Gone Too Far? Sally, as agreed, uh, I've set my timer here for three minutes. I'll start that as you start speaking. It'll go off, and then if you could start wrapping up, maybe 20 or 30 seconds after that, if that's okay with you. Great, thank you. So if you could push the button to speak. Ah, oh, fine, I've got a red light. So thank you very much for allowing me to speak. Um, I'm talking about the East, uh, West and East Greenwich Neighbourhood Management Scheme. This is a very big traffic, uh, low traffic neighbourhood, as it used to be called. Low traffic neighbourhood is a misnomer, as we all know, because the traffic is low in East and West Greenwich. There has been an experimental scheme already from 2020 to 22, which failed. There are many serious objections to the options that have been put forward by the council, um, and the council has not consulted um, in any appropriate manner over this. Although there was an online consultation, there were attempts to skew it by putting out a leaflet with misleading information on it. And we are very concerned about the overall conception of the area. Um, Councillor Lacau has talked about the overall strategy being to reduce emissions. And it's true that transport emissions are a very high element of overall global um, emissions and in central London it's a very serious problem. Most of those emissions occur on the boundary roads and our boundary roads here which extend from Greenwich South Street to the A102 have already been described by um, the Imperial College study as um, who've identified them as focus areas for high emissions. Four out of the boroughs ten um, focus areas are actually on the boundaries, not in the areas that are meant to be protected. The boundaries are much more densely populated and um, you're very well aware of all the, uh, the amount that we've written and put out publicly about how this will affect the boundary population. So it's a very serious matter that um, an even bigger scheme has been put forward for no good reason. So if you're talking about reducing emissions, they, there will be very long journeys taken because what's called the line of severance is now 1.5 miles all that way. And many people will be diverted around that boundary who have no other choice about whether to drive in the area or not. Um, the area does not meet your transport. Sorry, I'm just skipping through my stuff so that I don't take up too much time. First of all, you have, there's no concrete evidence provided. And I can reel off a list that's been put forward to the council um, by an expert on national transport logistics, David Quornby, who can't be here tonight. Um, but if you want further information on that, then I'm very happy to provide it. Many other people who've written to the council have received no response for simple requests for this kind of hard information. Um, and the other thing that we're very concerned about is a consultation that has returned up to 83% of the community who are against the scheme. Um, no, there's been no, there's been a failure to consider the very high gradients in the area. And I just, do you, would you like me to outline the areas of your transport strategy which are not served by this, or uh, would you like me to shut up? Uh, well, uh, that 
you are over the three minutes. Okay. But yeah, if you don't mind wrapping up very quickly, Sally. Right. It doesn't reduce car dependency, and I can explain why. Uh, it undermines safety. The emergency services have, were consulted in mid-October and have condemned the scheme as dangerous. Um, and that is not something that's publicly known. We found this out by Freedom of Information Act. It degrades transport capacity, so it doesn't serve your economic interests. Thank you very much. On those last points, uh, I noticed that Ryan was taking notes there, uh, which I'm hoping you might be able to address some of the specifics on that. I have uh, some clarifications that I'd like to ask Ms. Hughes. Uh, are there any other members that would like to jump in before me? <laughs> okay, thank you. So you mentioned 83%, so two items around the consultation. Uh, you described the consultation as not being appropriate. And you also talked about 83% of residents the people who, residents who, objected. Who responded to the, an online commonplace survey. Right, thank you. So on that, uh, one of the questions I'm going to be asking uh, officers is around the 83%. And was that 83% of respondents? So I'd be particularly interested in hearing, as I imagine other members of the panel would be, the overall response rates in that consultation. Can I qualify uh, that? Uh, sorry, I, uh, if I... Okay, but I said up to 83%. So up to, okay, up to. So I'd be interested in that 83% and that 83% what it was of. So if will you come back, if you could take a note of answering that question for the benefit of the panel. Are we going to be going to and fro? Are we going to listen to all and get the questions? Or? No, so all I'm doing is I'm clarifying Sally's points at the moment. And when I bring officers and yourself up, uh, cabinet member, uh, if you could address those points. And if they're not, then on behalf of the people who are here, We'll be following up on that. I just want what I'm hoping to do is clarify the questions so that we don't have to go back to audience members to re ask the question. So I'm trying to understand the question as well as I can uh, to ensure that we can get the best answer. So, yes, around the actual consultation rate returns, how much it went out to if we have that information. Around 10 respondents. Okay. Uh, yeah. When we come back on and we're on the record, we'll handle that. Great. So that was the consultation and the appropriateness and the 83%. Uh, will that question suffice? I think the other questions around the boundary population effects, the additional journey distances, and the evidence base, hopefully officers will be able to provide some responses on that when we come to them. Uh, was there anything else that I haven't summarized within that on questions we'd like to hear back? That the emergency services have Emergency objected services, to the thank you. And they describe it as dangerous. I have a transcript, and I also have the actual FOI uh, results for our investigations. Great. Thank you, I were, and emergency. I, you know, I knew I'd missed one, and so thank you for keeping track of what I was keeping track of. Well, I'd also like to mention the gradients, but I know that others will, so... Yeah, um, thank you, and as we said, we're, we're somewhat over the three minutes, but thank you very much for those contributions, and hopefully we'll be able to, uh, for the satisfaction of the panel, get there. Councillor Hartley. Thank you, Chair. May I ask a clarification question of Sally? Thank you. Um, thank you very much for making your representation. Can I ask, on the consultation itself, as somebody and uh, as one of many people who are opposed to this proposed scheme, do you feel the questions that were asked in the consultation gave you the opportunity to express that opposition? They did give us the opportunity to express that opposition, but what I'm questioning is the principles, uh, the national principles, the accepted principles of consultation, what we've been consulted before. But um, they did give us a question to they did give us an opportunity to say what was wrong. I think the coverage of the um, consultation was very poor because people were not informed. They were sent a letter that said that it was about a neighbourhood management scheme and put an online address on a paper letter. That makes it less accessible for people who are not net accessible. Uh, a good deal of members who live in the, who are part of the BAME community or on, in low-income families or older people, particularly those on boundary roads, don't have, they aren't capable of latching on or even finding out about these things. Thank you. Uh, was there a follow-up to that? Great. Thank you very much, Sally. Uh, Eleanor, I think I saw you raising your hand. Can I ask if you could ask that question as part of your presentation? Uh, or when you're speaking to us. Thank you. Well, that's fine. If you could raise that we're during your three minutes. Thank you. Uh, sorry, ma'am. Uh, you are representing the same organisation as Ms Hughes?
Right, well, thank you. Thank, great, thank you for that. When you spoke earlier, and I do apologize if there was a misunderstanding, but when I asked you which group you were representing, you told me that you were part of the uh, Greenwich Gone Too Far group, and I asked you to raise your points with Sally so that she could include that within her allocated time. Uh, so if that's okay, what we can do is we will take written questions which can be sent in to us afterwards. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. I'd like to now call Neil Robertson, who is the coordinator of Greenwich Cyclist. Neil, uh, again, if you could press the button to speak, and uh, then you will have three minutes, and then you'll hear the alarm go off, and then if you could start wrapping up. Um, I think Sally got away with slightly more than the 30 seconds wrap up, but if we could try and stick to that, because we do have a rather large agenda. Thank you. I shall try. Thank you, Chair. Um, the transport strategy uh, update was uh, good to hear. Health, safety and attractive streets, the, the targets are where we need to go. Um, we know that uh, the excessive um, uh, exhaust fumes that we get through traffic in London are really uh, awful. Um, we now know that cancer is going to hit one in two people. The, um, the fact that we've got 40 million cars on the road and there's, that's five million more in the last decade. And we've now got a government who's telling us to go out and buy more cars, be they electric or anything we're hardly going to get around anywhere. So the fact that um, the transport strategy is going to take us forward to make it safer for people to travel actively is going to improve the health. In here, in this room, we listened to the Director of Health telling us that uh, only 61% of people in Greenwich achieve their activity levels. That's 150 minutes uh, of moderate activity a week, and that hits people's health. We know that there are 28.8% of year six children are obese. We need the health of people in the borough to improve, and active travel will help to do that. There's a lot in here which will help. Um, there are, uh, specifically in here, we look at EV charging, which we don't want uh, the footway to be cluttered with EV charging. We also don't want the roads in certain places to be cluttered with those, where eventually we will get cycle routes in because then you'll have to remove those EV chargers. So it's very important where they go. Um, speed is a serious problem. It's across the country, and we know in the borough, um, down at, uh, at Plumstead, it was being discussed uh, yesterday, uh, the death of, of people crossing at a, tr a lip crossing, um, which was at red, um, and people being killed. So excess speed, 20 mile an hour zones sounds like a fairly cheap solution. Oh, um, it fits with the carbon neutral plan. We're fitting with the vision zero strategy. But one thing I'd like to ask is about disability. I very rarely hear or see anyone with disability uh, being talked to and can, they may be described as being considered, but I don't see any interaction with people with disabilities and I, I spend a lot of time with people with disabilities. So um, it, it's worrying that no one ever says there's a constant, oh well people with disabilities must drive. I know a lot and lot of people with disabilities who cycle, so they're on both sides of this. I'll have to stop there. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Neil, and for raising all those pertinent points. In terms of questions uh, 
to be considered as part of this. I took away uh, disability groups and individual participation in the consultation in the consultation and development of these plans as one of the items we'd like to see addressed. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to now call Eleanor Restall from the West Charlton Residents Association. Eleanor, again, you have three minutes, at which point the alarm will go off, and then if you could begin wrapping up. Thank you. Okay. I just want to say very quickly at the start um, that in a previous role I worked in market research, and in our local area we leafleted people to say that the questionnaire for com commonplace was clearly loaded to encourage people's agreement with the scheme. And what we um, advised people to do in Charlton was to say that they disagreed strongly with everything and to put any comments that they wished to make in the feedback because that was their only option in which to put it. Okay, so on behalf of our residence area, we've uh, been sorry, repeatedly... Uh, do you mind me asking, so the consultation you're specifically referring to is the controlled parking zone, is it? Um, no, I'm talking about um, the um, East and West Greenwich Neighbourhood Management Scheme once again. Um, we've repeatedly tried to ask on behalf of residents, have any traffic surveys been carried out for the Charlton Slopes West Charlton area, looking at the potential impact of the West and East Greenwich LTNs, and if so, what are they? We tried to ask at the Woodish Town Hall consultation after being denied entry to earlier consultations. We asked our Horn Fair Ward councillors and Avril Lacau, but only got a response after getting our MP to be involved on our behalf. We have submitted freedom of information requests, which is answered late and unsatisfactorily, and are still waiting for the outcome of an internal review, which won't be until January. The council claimed to have good baseline traffic data inside and around the scheme, but have referred us to Appendix D of the Steer LTN monitoring report comparing 2019 with the data collected in 2021, which, in which with their own report they admit um, that that's been impacted by the pandemic, so we've got absolutely no faith in that data. They've also tried to claim, based on that flawed report, um, that the traffic will use the A102 Blackwall Tunnel approach and Woolwich Road and not use Victoria Way because it has 20 mile an hour um, speed limit and speed humps and Charlton Church Lane because it has a banned right turn onto the Woolwich Road. Now, anyone with local knowledge is aware that the A102 is regular to standstill in both directions during peak times and with all the north-south routes east of uh, Greenwich Church Street in East West Greenwich closed or restricted to deter through traffic, Eastcombe Avenue and Victoria Way will become boundary roads likely to experience much higher traffic and pollution, particularly at peak times. It's not just our residents' association, but also the Charlton Society and Westcombe Society who clearly believe that and have complained about this to the council. The area we're talking about is a residential area with three primary schools and we're very concerned that it will particularly increase congestion and pollution at the narrow end of Eastcombe Avenue approaching the junction with Victoria Way opposite Faustine Primary School. This will also inevitably de delay the local 380 bus route which already struggles to navigate this part of its route but which is the only form of public transport available in this Healy area with steep gradients and provides an essential service for many elderly disabled and those with health issues including my special needs daughter who uses it to get to secondary school school. So my question is, how can the council be allowed to run an experiment on the lives of local residents without properly researching its impact and considering the social justice of low traffic areas versus polluted boundary ones? We're also very concerned, uh, me as an SEN parent, about the impact on disabled, vulnerable uh, SEN and low income families. And um, we want to know um, uh, minutes, names uh, and details of those who've been con consulted from minority groups, specifically the disabled, vulnerable and low income households and people of colour. Uh, we want to know, um, a parent of James Wolfe has raised how disabled children in specialist transport from outside the borough can be safely delivered to school in a timely fashion when their routes are going to be denied. Will there be extra funding for that? Have our RGB got any evidence of the families thank, being informed thank you, Eleanor, consulted? That, Eleanor, thank you. There is, okay. is uh, thank, you. thank you for that very comprehensive. Uh, if you don't mind staying there. I have got there. it all on paper. Yeah, if, you don't mind, if you don't mind just staying there, there may be some clarifications that okay, certainly I've sure. got some. I have got the freedom of information requests and all the emails uh, with me. Yes. Thank you. So that wasn't actually going to be the question that I asked. I'll yeah. come to members, but I have a couple of clarifications, if you don't mind me going first. Um, so what I took from that was uh, comments around the consultation process and the question about how it was administered. Yeah, uh, trials and residents actually were never so, specifically consulted sorry, or informed. If, we so let them know. Sorry. Yeah, so I'm just yeah. summarising the questions. Sure, uh, sure, sure. I'm, Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and, and how that was within that, sorry, so it was uh, how the consultation was conducted and administered. Yes. Uh, within that, I believe you raised the item of loaded questions. Yes. 
uh, which is something I took from that. Uh, you mentioned a flawed report. Yes, the SEER um, report. All right. And then you also talked about uh, traffic surveys and monitoring. Yes, whether it had been properly researched, especially the impact yeah. on boundary areas. That's fine. And uh, that's what I had. Was there anything else that I missed? Sorry, that's um, Harley. Also the impact on uh, local primary schools. Yeah. Um, James Wolfe has been denied a school street as well. Um, and um, impact on public transport, of which there's very little impact. in areas with steep gradients where so people are So impacts on struggling. schools and public transport. Great. Chair, Thank it, you. And that, disabled and vulnerable. Okay. Sorry. Uh, Thank no, you. apologies. That was the point I wanted to make sure was captured, that uh, particularly the impact on the 380 bus route. And uh, I think it's a worthwhile question to ask officers how um, impact on bus routes specifically are, are considered in developing proposals. Thank you, Councillor Hartley. Uh, yes, I agree with that. I am aware, however, that the consultation is something that's in progress, so we may not actually have all of those items here. So officers mm -hmm. may be able to answer those questions or they may not be able to. So just for yourself, I will accept uh, the consultation is in progress. No decisions have been made, but we'll be taking these items into account. Mm -hmm. um, and I will seek an undertaking from officers when they return that uh, your comprehensive notes that you have there will be passed to them and they will address those within the consultation if they haven't been raised already, but I suspect they possibly have. It's certainly gone to Avril and it's certainly gone to Freedom of Information. Great. And we've asked Thank for an you. internal review. So Thank what I will you. do is ask that. Great. So I think I've got everything here. Uh, I just wanted to say, so Sorry. the consultation, <laughs> I've, I've never had anyone this, this eager to get away from Sorry. me. This is terrible. <laughs> and you're one of my residents, I believe, in my ward as well. Yes. Um, that would probably <laughs> explain it. <laughs> um, yeah. So there may be some questions within that that can't be answered here, but they have been mm -hmm. heard and they will be taken on board. Uh, by the officers, and if they're not, when we're reviewing the consultation responses as uh, ward councillors, uh, so previous consultations, they've gone out to the ward councillors as well to review and say that we accept that all the points raised have been addressed, um, and that's part of the consultation process as well. But there may not be answers to all of those because I'm not sure whether uh, the information may be available, but officers will be able to update us on that. Great, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I now have Joe Jeffrey from One Greenwich, if you'd like to come forward. Thank you, Joe. Good evening. Uh, Sorry, first, Joe, just before sorry. you start, if I could just remind uh, members of the public who have made representations this evening. This is a review of the overall transport strategy and the three items that have been raised, uh, well, the items raised by at least two of these speakers relate to one aspect of what we'll be looking at. So it is incumbent on this panel to ensure we consider the whole report. So uh, I know it's the one item you've raised, but we will be considering that in the proportion that is given within the update. Uh, so that's just in terms of expectation management. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very uh, much for letting me speak. Um, as Chair has just said, I'd like to express my concerns over the Western East Greenwich uh, Traffic Management Scheme. According to the Council's own findings, the last LTN scheme disproportionately affected people with protected characteristics, including people with small children, disabled people, elderly people, as well as carers and people from certain ethnic backgrounds. It was also determined that the scheme, in part, led to an increase of traffic by up to 27% on sacrificial boundary roads. That's according to the council's own decision report dated February 22. My first concern is how the council will ensure those disproportionately affected the last time won't be affected this time around. There's been no consultation with disabled or elderly charities, um, nor any parent groups, Instead, the council has stated the consultation is open to all. If people actually know that it's actually taking place, that is. Uh, my second concern is that throughout the course of the consultation, residents were repeatedly assured by cabinet members, councillors and council officers that the council continued to work with emergency services, and that's a quote. 
in response to concerns raised by residents over delays evidenced in the last failed scheme. While residents' anxieties about these delays were dismissed quite literally as myths, the council actually called them myths in their latest literature that was posted through thousands of doors in the borough. It appears the only myth was that the council had liaised with emergency services when they said they did. In fact, emergency services have since confirmed that they weren't even contacted by the council until the 16th of October. That's many, many weeks after the consultation had closed and many months after the public were first assured that the council were liaising with them. So aside from concerns over officers and cabinet members misleading the public over correspondence with emergency services. Sorry, I'm just gonna to have to stop you there. Uh, if you're going to make statements like misleading, yeah. I am gonna require you to substantiate that or please withdraw that. Uh, I, I, can sub I, I, I can substantiate it with um, correspondence from uh, yeah, emergency I, I'd, services. I'd, I'd rather not impugn uh, the position of officers and cabinet members by suggesting they're misleading because uh, that suggests a willful and deliberate misleading of them, which... Okay, I mean, so the ICO... I'm, I'm just, being, I'm just yeah. asking you to be very careful. Sure, Thank absolutely. You. Thank you. No, that's fine. I should add um, that the ICO have confirmed that they will be investigating it because it was a misleading statement to have made. Uh, I don't know if that holds any... Uh, In that case, I'd rather not prejudice the outcome of any ICO okay, investigation. I'll continue Thank then. You. If, yeah. Um, so, aside from concerns over uh, correspondence with emergency services, another issue to raise is how the council can actually roll out a similar souped-up version of a scheme that failed the last time and affected emergency services in the way it did, as is evidenced by several FOIs that are available to view. Um, but further, um, yeah, sorry, I've, that last bit yeah. lost me. But um, how, how they can actually roll out schemes that have been known to affect emergency services in the past? Yeah, sure, sure. Um, so far, the council's mishandling of this scheme has resulted in at least eight complaints lodged with the ICO and two current active investigations being undertaken by the local government ombudsman. And that's just by me. Uh, it's a complete and utter shambles and, and these issues do need to be addressed. Thank you. Sorry. Are there any questions or clarifications the panel would like to seek? No, great, in that case, if I could summarize, Joe, what I took from that is, uh, the potential for a disproportionate effect on the disabled and elderly and parents and how were they involved in the consultation, the impact on sacrificial boundary roads and the levels of engagement with the emergency services. Um, yeah. And in, term, so, uh, and in terms of any ICO or LGO uh, complaints that may have been raised, I'm gonna ask officers not to engage with that because that's not necessarily something that we do as, as part of the scrutiny function, we're sure. here to look at that. Um, was there anything that I've missed? Uh, no, but I, I would like to stress the, um, the, the query as to how the council will actually ensure that those who were affected by the last scheme will ensure that they're not affected this time around, considering they're sort of expanding the actual uh, scheme that failed the last time. Great, so I'm gonna capture that as lessons learned from previous scheme and how they're being in Absolutely, that was yeah. great, thank you. Great. Chair, might I suggest a, thank you. an extra one for your, your list of things to capture, which was the point Joe made about that leaflet that used the word myths mm. and how that um, we heard the perception that that was minimising people's objections. Could we perhaps just ask that uh, to come, uh, as a, as a follow-up question, because that's uh, a point that's been made a couple of times this evening. That's a great point, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hartley. Uh, I'm happy for you to raise that. Uh, in terms of my view, uh, I am very keen that this is actually a review of the transport strategy update and I'm just acutely conscious that I don't necessarily want it to be hijacked by this particular single issue. But yes, please, by all means, raise that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'd like to uh, suggest we recall officers, please. Um, again,
do you need to, sorry, uh, before you come back, I've got a lady raising her hand in the front row. So I'll, As a parent. Sorry, can I just get your name, madam? Jennifer Donovan. Jennifer. Uh, are panel members all right for me to take this question from Jennifer? Please, yes, Jennifer, if you wouldn't mind approaching the microphone. Thank you. Uh, would you, do you. Is it one question or do you want the three minutes plus 30 seconds? I think three minutes would be grand, if that's all right. <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> uh, you have um, three minutes starting now. Okay, thank you very much for letting me speak and I'm sorry for the confusion. I am... Um, deeply concerned as a parent in Greenwich, but not fortunate enough in Greenwich to have an SE10 postcode. So though I, my child has a disabled blue badge due to her disabilities, like the gentleman who spoke earlier, there's been very, very little reference or, cre or answers afforded to people like me or unpaid carers living and traveling within the borough to support those that they care for. It is already an excruciating existence. We've often given up careers and many other things in life. We are on limited budget, limited time, limited sleep and tolerance in all other things in life. So to then find that for some reason, somebody in Greenwich Council is blessed with the decision-making power to decide that my child with an SE18 postcode is less worthy of accessing the street where they go to school than somebody who owns a townhouse on Crooms Hill or Royal Hill, I think anybody of reasonable mind would consider abhorrent, and I would invite anybody from those making these decisions to give us some reasoning. It's not something we've ever had. I don't understand how a blue badge can be awarded to anybody based on their disability, but their postcode then discounts it and I, I would like answers on that. Furthermore, I was told in the previous meeting held here by the leader of the council and assured when I asked a question regarding an unthinkable situation where we may have something akin to the Manchester Arena tragedy, say, for instance, at the O2, I was assured categorically that they had not only been consulted, but that the police had provided contingency plans. We now know that that is a falsehood, that statement, that never occurred. So as a parent... Yeah, sorry, Jennifer, I'm going to have to... Uh, again, um, um, that's not a statement you agree with. I think stating it's a falsehood uh, is quite contentious, so if you wouldn't mind not doing that. Okay, okay, well, I would be grateful then if somebody here this evening could substantiate an evidence for all of us attending here and taking time out this evening to be here with our concerns for the last time to show us an evidence as what the emergency services did actually state and how they assured us that these contingency plans are in place because we have had no visibility of them. Thank you. You've actually finished well within the three minutes, so thank you very much. If you don't mind, panel, I thank you. could summarise. So thank you, Jennifer. And Je Jennifer, so Jennifer, uh, we may, I've got a couple of clarifications that I just wanted to run past you. Sorry, Avril, if you don't mind. Uh, so what I took from that was provision for blue badge users within the uh, proposed East West Greenwich traffic management area, and also the impact of the design, proposed design of any low traffic neighborhoods on emergency services access. Those were the two yes, I Yes, and access for those with special needs. Yes, yeah, so special needs, and blue, but in particular, I took away from that was provisions for blue badge users and... Yes. Yes, great, and, thank and you. And those, not just the holders of them, but those that care for those owning the badge, if that makes sense. Yes, so, yeah. Yeah, so essentially uh, blue badge exclusions Yes. from the conditions of any traffic regulation system. As other boroughs have implemented with similar schemes. Yes, yes. thank you. So as I'm sure you're, you're aware, the consultation has closed now, but the results are still being processed. So I don't want to prejudge anything, and that will be, probably be coming back to a group such as ours to review at some later point. But if it's something officers are able to address now, I'd urge you to or just say you recognize this and this is taken into account. Uh, thank you very much. I'd like to thank everyone. Thank you. Uh,
Uh, so can you just press the button on your microphone to turn it off? Thank you. I'd like to thank everyone who's made representations this evening. Uh, please be assured, if you'd like to follow that up with written uh, representations, please send that to the panel at the committee's address, and we will be including that uh, to pass on to officers to consider within their uh, consultation exercise. I, I have submitted via email to my local councillor, my local MP, um, Avril, and the leader of the... Great, thank you very much. Uh, one of the items we will be covering will be uh, how we actually manage consultations around that, because uh, it is important that we actually get that right so that uh, as policy evolves, people are consulted and taken along with that. Great, thank you very much, Jennifer. Um, uh, officers and cabinet member, if you wouldn't mind returning. Um, just one thing I would like to say is we've heard a lot of representations from people on this. Uh, I'm sure other panel members agree. Please say if you don't. I, this is a, an update, so a lot of the questions we will be asking, we're going to take, uh, well, I'm certainly going to take a view that what has been said has been heard by the officers. Uh, I've summarized the points at the end of it, and uh, I'd like that to be taken into account. Uh, so if we could just make sure we're considering the entire update report in our questions as we go along. Uh, who'd like to start us off? Councillor Hartley. Thank you, yes. Um, so uh, apologies for not following along. Complica complex meeting uh, being chaired exceptionally well. Um, uh, you've summarised those questions from the speakers. Um, are you going to put those questions to the officers or are you saying that that's, that's going to be taken away and noted and we can ask questions on, on, on the report? I think that's something for us to decide as a panel. So certainly from my view, I have summarised the questions. I could summarise them all. Or I think it might be something, uh, I think I saw Ryan jotting down notes as we went through. So if it's something you'd like to address, if it's something you can do whole, wholesale, um, or it's something that needs further development, if you can advise us of that and we won't carry it forward. But I'd just like to remind officers and the cabinet members uh, that this is actually meant to review the whole thing. But again, uh, all councillors have a democratic right to ask any questions they wish. Fine. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I suppose, yes, I agree. Uh, fine. So may I ask a couple of questions? And um, some of this will overlap with what we've heard and, and that, you know, the, the speakers have, have raised a couple of things that I, do, I did want to raise in, in any case on, on this element of the report. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Harley. As you say, this has been an extremely complex scrutiny meeting, so I expect there will be overlaps and possibly carries over and a whole load of stuff. So if you'd like to take us away. Thank you, Chair. I'm, I'm, I'm with you now. Thank you. Um, my first question, uh, sort of set, uh, couple of questions, is about the consultation process. So, as you say, Chair, this is about the whole transport strategy, starting with the... Uh, I'm, I'm trying to generalise these questions, uh, Chair. Um, the consultation process for traffic management schemes, and we've heard one example from speakers tonight in Western East Greenwich, um, where, you know, you've heard there is a feeling that the... Um, that, you know, I, I've heard from many people who've used the, exactly the same word as Eleanor used, that the questions were loaded, um, the consultation was not a fair one, and that people who object to the scheme don't have uh, an equal access to be able to uh, express that objection. And, um, and that, in that particular example, was amplified by this leaflet that was sent out from the council that, as we heard from another speaker, from Joe, um, the perception of that leaflet was that people's objections were being minimized and disregarded as myths. And um, I'm just a bit confused because uh, surely it's in everybody's interest to have a non-loaded consultation and a scheme that everybody, you know, whether people are, are for or against can have confidence in the process by which the scheme was arrived at. And I think uh, in that example, and I fear in other examples if this isn't addressed, systemically, um, the council is getting that wrong. So uh, if I could put it to the cabinet member and or officers, um, can we perhaps, can the council perhaps look again at the questions that were asked, the process of that consultation, and do a bit of a lessons learned exercise so that the council can, in future consultations, make sure uh, there isn't a perception of an unfair process, as there very clearly is in this case. 
Thank you, Councillor Hartley. And if you don't mind, panel, me breaking my own rule, um, if as part of the answer to Councillor Hartley, you could provide us with some background information on where we are on the specific uh, East-West Greenwich traffic management consultation. I know there are a number of stages of consultation that we go through. So if you could just give us an idea of that, so that will allow us to kind of calibrate our answers. Thank okay, you. Okay, can I take that one? Um, at the moment, we're, we're still collating all the um, evidence. We, um, the decision has not yet been made, or a decision hasn't been made. We're still putting everything together. Um, we are also yet to have the equalities impact statement, um, and therefore it's very difficult to start to have a discussion when everything is not on the table. You know, but what I can say in terms of the consultation, and I think this is, um, it speaks to this idea about letters not being responded to. Um, many people said they wanted to, they had so much that they wanted to say, could they write some, some of their comments in? And a lot of that, I mean, the inbox was absolutely inundated, and that was all fed in to the information. So you had on the, um, the form, as one of the speakers said, there was opportunity to add your own comments. Um, but also, many people wrote in with their comments, and that was included. So if you were writing in uh, to add your comments, it wasn't seen as that's something that needed the response, because it was meant to feed into that process. And to be fair to the officers, today we came on uh, to discuss the update, so it's only at the very 11th hour that we realized that the topic was um, going to be taken over by the, the LTNs. If we were going to do that, what we would have done is to say, okay, where are we on the LTNs? What information can we give out? And we'd have made sure we checked that with legal. Thank you for that clarification, Cabinet Member. And also, yes, just to remind, uh, and for the benefit of any members of the audience, these reports are actually commissioned by us as a scrutiny panel, so I'm not taking questions. Uh, are commissioned by us as a scrutiny panel. Uh, therefore, we actually develop our work program and ask for these updates some periods in advance to allow us to prepare. And that is very much something we'd like to adhere to. Sorry, back to you, Councillor Hartley. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, and just on that point, I mean, these are questions I was coming to the meeting to ask based on this report, and I'm keeping them generic to policy and strategy and process. And um, it, it so happens that they, uh, that has been illustrated by this one example tonight. But my, my question, uh, thank you for the response. Um, I, I, the question I asked was, uh, you know, are you prepared to do a lessons learned exercise on the consultation? Um, and, and if I could just add to that, in retrospect, do you think that the, the leaflet um, taking a very firm view, and which was perceived to be diminishing um, op, uh, people who opposed the schemes, diminishing their concerns, do you think in retrospect that was a mistake? I think that leaflet was um, sent out as a result of a leaflet that had gone before that, so it was a response to an, an, early, an earlier leaflet that had been sent out, which was using that kind of narrative. And so it was saying, you know, what that, the early, I haven't got the leaflets on me because obviously I'd have had this, but it was a response. No, the, yeah. Sorry, got, sorry, members of the public, sorry, ca cabinet member, sorry, members of the public, during your presentations, cabinet members and officers afforded you the respect of listening to yours without heckling and joining in. I would appreciate it if that could be extended to other people presenting to this panel. I do reluctantly have it within my authority to remove members from the room, and so it's not something I'm, hope I'm hoping it's not something I would have to do today. Thank you. Sorry, cabinet member, you can carry continue. Yeah, I was saying that that was in the context of a leaflet that went out. I mean, I. As I'm not looking at it now, I would be able to explain in more detail if I was looking at both leaflets, how um, that was devised. Okay, so let's zo just zooming out from that specific then, I think that's probably the best thing. Um, would you do a lessons learned exercise on the whole consultation process? Because, you know, I mean, what you've just said is, 
a leaflet went out in the community, um, uh, uh, you know, presumably opposing the scheme, and so the council reacted to that and put its own leaflet out in favour of the scheme. And you know, the, the, the wording that we heard was you know, the, the perception that the questions were loaded. And I do agree, I, I accept what you say, that there was an opportunity to give other feedback, and lots of people you've said emailed in with their views, and many of those will be opposing. Um, but you know, we've all been there, Chair, <coughs> colleagues, filling, filling in consultations from public bodies, not just the council, where the questions are, this is, the, this is a set of proposals, you know, do you agree with them in this way? Do you agree with them in that way? Or do you agree with them in the other way? And they are very clearly loaded. And I think there is a big perception that this was a, such a consultation. And I just don't understand it because I think if the council would run a true, fair, objective consultation, this is the proposal, not everybody will agree, here are some questions about what you think about it, neutrally worded, then everybody, whether, whether they get the outcome they want or not, would have confidence in the process. And I think we're very far away from that. So the question really is, uh, you know, would you uh, take that suggestion of a lessons learned exercise for future traffic management schemes? Um, we, we actually do do that. Um, after a traffic management scheme, we go through what went well and what could have been better. Um, you know, I know that we have met even with the um, Charlton uh, members and we looked through some of the things and how thing, uh, the consultation could be improved. So it's, a, it's, it's, doesn't, it's not static. You know, we try to learn lessons from each process. Um, and it's um, not the same criteria in different places. You know, so sometimes it needs to be nuanced. But yeah, we do. Yeah, Councillor Hartley, if I could just add to that. Uh, yes, uh, in the last consultation within my ward around parking, I believe it was, uh, we did actually go through it with uh, Councillor Cow, the preliminary stuff, and we fed our lessons learned in, and those lessons learned were incorporated into the final report as was published as appendices, including all the responses. Uh, but yes, I think what we've asked for is uh, essentially an undertaking from the officers and cabinet members that lessons learned from consultations will be taken forward into the others with a view of improving public confidence. Uh, public confidence in the integrity of the process, I would say, perhaps those wording. Um, and if I could suggest that as a recommendation the panel might make formally as, uh, on this report. Um. Uh, yeah, are panel members happy to take that as a recommendation we carry forward or would we like to save that till the end to make recommendations? Uh, if you don't mind, I'll take that till the end as recommendations and we'll consider on that then. Was there any follow-ups you had, Councillor Harley? Not on traffic management schemes. I have questions on other areas of the report, but shall I cede time for others to contribute and come back to me, perhaps? Uh, sorry, yes, Councillor Hannan, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, I just think perhaps we finish this and then we can move on to the other issue because it seems there's probably, people will probably leave after this discussion. Thank you. Do you have a follow-up on this particular yes, item? I Thank do. you. Yeah. Councillor Hannan, the floor is yours. I just wanted to say on, on the lesson learning, um, I know that even as the consultations were happening, officers and uh, Councillor Lacau were thinking about how they had gone and uh, pivoted and added additional consultations and had one at the town hall, which was the larger space and allowed more people in. So you mentioned that you couldn't get into the previous ones, but came to this, and that was because they recognized that they needed somewhere with a bigger space um, so people could come in. So I know that although, and I do agree that we do need to do a wider lesson learning, and I really appreciate the fact that you're saying you will do that, because um, I do think there are wider issues that need to be considered in how all of that was, was run and why it was run in that way. So I do look forward to seeing that lesson learning, uh, those, those things coming out of that. Um, I think I just wanted to say as well, and perhaps you would want to give an update on where you are. I realize that you haven't consulted and wasn't prepared to, to speak about this specifically, but I think it would be helpful for, for members of the audience to just understand where you are in the process um, and just, just to let them know what that will include and, and, uh, and what they can expect, um, when they can expect to hear back overall, if that's okay. Thank you. 
Um, we are taking it to members to have a, a, a debate on, and um, we will also be, uh, we're waiting for the, uh, the, the equality impact statement, as well as um, the fi final document of the um, report. We will, whichever way, be looking to make a decision by, I think, in, uh, January, February time. It, it, it would take a while to get to a decision point um, anyway, so, but within the first couple of months of next year, we'll be um, looking to make a decision. Thank you. And then the implementation, that's where we're going, will take its own time as well. And I understand as well that it would be um, it would be for a certain period, and then it will be reviewed again, and there'll be further consultations to understand how it's. Uh, Absolutely. I mean, uh, one of the problems with um, anything to do with traffic is unless you um, do an experimental order, it is based on that experimental order. All our various theories or concerns can be ma uh, measured, um, and and and. So during the first six months of that experimental order, we would need to do a consultation, looking at the data, looking at the, if that's the route we're taking. And, and you know I've I'm one of the ward councillors yes, directly within um, this scheme, and we have been speaking regularly with you and, and officers about this process, and have been, will specifically be looking at how feedback from the consultation has been taken on board. I know separately as ward councillors, we've been talking to Councillor Lacau about what, what the feedback has been and how that's been incorporated into the options that are being considered and what's being considered. So there's been a wider process with the ward councillors um, looking for verification of how that information from the consultation is incorporated into the, the redesign and the considerations within the scheme. So there is that wider process ongoing, but thank you for clarifying the next steps, April. And if I may chair, any, any areas um, around mitigation, um, be it um, blue badge, be it um, hard or soft, um, any, anything like that. If, there's, uh, if we're following through with any um, experimental order, would be contained within that document anyway. It would be jumping the gun for me to sit here or any of the officers to actually go through that without having um, gone through proper governance uh, processes first. Uh, Councillor Harley. Thank you, Chair. Um, there were just two sort of policy, on reflection, two policy questions, not about the specific scheme, but on traffic management that arose from the conversation earlier about uh, the bus routes question and emergency services that I wonder whether I might ask officers uh, as a policy gen generic point. Uh, yeah, please go ahead. I had a question around emergency service in the consultation, but you may be asking that as well. Um, why don't I leave that one to you, Chair, <laughs> and I'll ask about bus routes. Um, <coughs> before I do, could I just, oh, for what it's worth, for the record, echo what um, Councillor Hanan said about Councillor Lacau's engagement with ward councillors, because um, that's something that Councillor Dowes and Councillor Hills and I in our ward at the other end of the borough uh, have also experienced. And, you know, Avril is extremely good at engaging with ward councillors. So um, these things are always controversial, but I did just want to acknowledge that. Um, and uh, I think we're, we're all uh, sort of appreciative of her, the way she engages with, uh, with ward members. Um, so yes, I'll take the bus route question then. Um, uh, probably, probably more for officers, as Avril recovers from the shock of me saying something nice about her. Um, uh, <laughs> probably something um, for officers. Um, this question about the, th the uh, you know, the, the example that was raised was the 380 bus route on a boundary road. What can I just ask in general for a traffic management scheme? What is the engagement in developing proposals with TfL to? Um, assess and consider the impact on bus routes on boundary roads. So the answer is sort of nested in the wider range of issues that have been touched on in that, you know, these are schemes designed to reduce traffic and to manage kind of traffic down on all roads. 
and that the evidence doesn't show the very severe impacts on boundary roads in other areas that people fear. Uh, neither does the modelling we've undertaken. So that's part of, you know, coming at it from a slightly different angle. Uh, where they would have um, impacts on bus routes, we'd want to work very closely with TfL um, to understand their views. And I think for the monitoring for all of them, bus journey time is a really key piece of data. Um, so for this one, we proposed looking at the bus journey times on the surrounding routes because it's a really good, rich, live data source. And we'll be looking at that very carefully. But I suppose to say that we don't believe there's going to be a significant impact, TfL haven't told us so either. Um, it's part of a wider policy picture that will help the buses. Um, but we will be measuring that very carefully. Um, Thanks. I even suppose if we weren't, TfL wouldn't let us not. <laughs> Indeed. Um, okay, thank you. I suppose it's a process question, really. You know, take a generic traffic management scheme um, that is being worked up by the department. Um, do TfL have the opportunity early doors to, to comment on the impact on their operations, their bus routes, and, and what does that look like process-wise? I don't think we've had a typical traffic management scheme yet post-COVID. They're all, you know, it's a new field and it's developing quickly, but yes, we'd always engage TfL early on all of our schemes that would impact their network. So okay, thank you. Time. And I take the point about that. I was just trying to stay on the right side of the chair. Thank you, Chair. Sorry, go ahead, Avril. Um, I just also wanted to correct um, something that was said earlier. Um, the meeting here at the uh, town hall, what the leader said was the council engages all the time in emergency planning. So of, if there's any big event in the borough, we have gold, silver, and bronze team that work with all the partners in terms of emergency planning. The question that he had been asked is, if something happened at the O2, big, what would, and he said, that's all contained within the emergency planning. It was in that context. Uh, thank you for that clarification, and I think you actually preempted the question I was going to ask. Uh, so, just as a further clarification for my reassurance, the same question that Councillor Hartley asked, but with the words emergency services substituted for uh, TfL. Um, similar answer with the substitutions, but um, I think there's... Why not? Um, we engage with the emergency services on an ongoing basis from the big gold scale planning for huge incidents through to ongoing dialogues with colleagues in the emergency services looking at this kind of issue. Um, there have been ongoing discussions with them since, certainly in a formal way, since the pandemic and we started introducing more of these schemes. Um, and that's been ongoing throughout. We've had feedback from them which we'll consider, put forward to be considered in the decision. Um, I think the references to freedom of information requests um, could be a little misleading because they've requested the correspondence. A lot of those are ongoing discussions and engagements we have as officers and emergency services persons working together. They're not minuted meetings, they're not exchanges of letters. They were contacted around the public consultation period because they're not the public we have an ongoing dialogue with them so we do it on different time scales um, so we absolutely have been engaging with them it just might not show up in the way in those documents and the way people expect but it's an ongoing dialogue great thank you very much and if we were going ahead with a uh, traffic management order you would expect mitigation in that for the emergency services Thank you very much. Councillor Asgar. Thank you. The January-February date, is that for the experimental traffic order or is that when you come up with the results of the, the, the final <coughs> details of the scheme? And also, um, when is the equalities impact assessment expected and will any decisions be taken bef before that is received? Thank you. We cannot take decisions unless all of that is um, contained within the decision-making process. Um, and that's why I was talking about, you know, 
the, the, the due process of decision making. And so I don't want to start preempting um, some of that stuff now. Um, but all of that would be contained and the decision, whichever way it's going, would be made at that time. You know, whichever way, and I don't want to preempt that. Because again, I've not, I need to also consult with the relevant people. Legal has to see it and so on and so forth. So January, February was more of a, that's not what it's gonna be implemented. It's gonna be when the decision is taken and then impl implementation, if something is gonna be implemented, will be after that. Okay, thank you. Great, are there any other specific questions on this item? In which case, I propose that we move on to the more general items. Uh, we've actually been going for uh, a little over two hours now. Uh, would panel members like to take a short comfort break and we can return in 10 minutes? Yeah, thank you. Is that, are you officers and cabinet member okay with that? Thank you. We will return uh, at uh, nine minutes to. Thank you. Thank you, panel members, for returning from your break so promptly. Um, given the late hour and the remaining items of the, on the agenda, uh, I, the, yeah, <laughs> the, uh, I have con uh, spoken with the Royal Greenwich Heritage Trust, who will be making a presentation, who were planning to make a presentation under item seven of this meeting, and with their permission, and I'd like to express our profound apologies to them for having wasted their time this evening in coming over. Uh, we have agreed to defer their item. I've consulted with panel members and uh, as well as uh, our committee services and we'll be looking to defer that to March with the panel's uh, permission. Thank you. Right, uh, we can reconvene. So I'd like to uh, just ask one clarification, if I may, around the impact and this will hopefully be the last question we ask on the uh, East-West Greenwich Traffic Management Scheme. Um, in terms of an implementation date and the consultation and when the decision is going to be made, uh, a question was raised with me during the break that the decision on it is scheduled to be made next week, whereas we were told in the panel that it's not due till early next year. If you could just provide clarity on that and then we can move on to the next items. That, that person knows more than the person making the decision, is what I'd say. I think it's a cabinet decision. I think the date of next week is what's on the full plan, which is the earliest date at which a decision can be taken. So it's when the notice period expires and a decision could be taken. Any point after that, the cabinet member could make a decision. Great, thank you very much. Councillor Asgar, you had a point to make? Yes, so I'm just clarifying, it's, is it the, sorry, um, Councillor Cow, you said it's a cabinet decision. Is it a cabinet decision or the cabinet member's decision? Thank you. Cabinet member. Thank you. Great, thank you. So to summarize that clarification, the date of next week that I was questioned on is the forward plan earliest date that it could be made, but the plans currently are for this not to be made until the early part of the new year. Thank you. Uh, all right, I will now open up to questions on the remainder of the transport strategy update. I see a number of hands go up. Uh, who, went, who would like to go first? Councillor Hartley, you've gone first every time. Uh, Councillor Dowes. <laughs> Blimey, the responsibility. Um, I would like to move the subject on to the south of the borough. Um, I think that it's widely acknowledged that transport, public transport there is quite poor. Um, the, and I know it's not within your gift to give us additional buses and whatnot, but the trains were reduced quite dr drastically. And as a train user, I can definitely say those trains are crammed full. Buses are pretty non-existent. Um, but there's not really much of a nod to that in this, in your transport strategy in this part of it. I just wondered if you can sort of expand a bit on 
what you would like to see and what you're going to lobby for to try and improve the situation, which is not good. And car, I, I can't believe that car use has gone down there at all because there's very little other way to get around. Thank you. I'll, I'll start and then you can. Um, during the consultation um, with TfL on the bus, the Superloop, um, one of the things we said was there were, you know, this is great for that part of the world, but how the, there was connectivity was um, a problem. But it, we also stated very clearly that for us, it didn't address or didn't even go anywhere near addressing the north-south um, bus routes, which we felt is really important um, and not uh, at the level that we would expect. We've also always said that, you know, we've asked for a bus review. Um, is what you call it? The bus, uh, TfL to review the bus provision and bus routes in, in the borough. So because that particular issue was um, what was behind that motivation. Uh, just to add, tucked away in the report, there are there's some comments on some of the events that have happened that have also affected it, which include the reduction in uh, train services and some unfortunate reductions in bus services. Um, as Councillor Cowser, we work very hard to try and counter that. Um, I think not to the south, but to the east of the borough, 23 million pounds for the bus rapid transit is a big, a big win. Um, moving to the south and kind of other areas, Councillor Cow led a meeting with the new uh, sort of senior officer at TfL responsible for bus strategy, um, and they that seemed positive. And there's discussions on the table about kind of all of our key public transport issues um, and kind of ways of moving forward with that, which. Um, I would say wasn't the case with predecessors, and it feel, feels more positive. So I think that's a good step. But it's something we're very aware of. Um, you know, it's a longer, slower fight, so maybe it doesn't show up in an annual report quite so strongly. Well, it's good to hear. I mean, just to note that that whilst other areas of the borough have got better trans, there's no connection for people in the south of the borough to use those you know, you might as well go to London and back out again. It's impossible to get to those. So it is really a, a cut-off area, I think. Um, so, yeah, as long as you can... <laughs> that's always in your mind, I'll be very happy. <laughs> I never talk buses without bringing that in. Councillor Hannan. Thank you. Um, I just, I will have a few questions. I wanted to ask firstly about the budget for next financial year. You see, you've said that you have the budget and you've outlined that up to the end of this financial year, but I'm expecting that all of this plan that you've put forward will go into the next financial year. So how secure is your funding for that? And is that sufficient to take, keep the momentum going on these initiatives? Uh, um, having spent several five-hour sessions on the budget, um, budgets across the board are really, really challenged. Um, and we're having to really dig deep um, whilst trying to protect um, some of the key areas. And um, I don't really want to um, preempt that. Um, until those papers become available, but I cannot say that nothing will be impacted. Um, that's, that's just the reality. Um, fortunately, I think less so in transport um, amongst the areas that are in my portfolio. So, but yeah, we're still trying to protect as much as we can. Um, and in, in some area, particularly school streets, we're trying to see growth. So I guess my question is really whether, you're, uh, whether you have uh, alternative plans or considering other plans to raise additional funding or in other areas and how healthy that's looking or whether that's of, of concern. I think 
I'm going to let you answer, but um, I think when we started this journey, um, we took quite a hit from TfL in terms of our LIB funding. And part of that was that they were kind of frustrated because they didn't seem to think, because we started projects and we were pulling them. Um, so when they gave us the funding settlement, we got a lot less than we would have hoped for. But I think as uh, TfL has seen that we've really been pushing forward um, the agenda, um, I'm hoping um, not that we will get a, a better settlement um, in the next town. Just to add that in the short term, um, the TfL funding referred to in the report is for this financial year. They've asked for us to indicate our proposals for next financial year on the basis of the same amount. Um, they haven't confirmed to us what we will get, but that you know, leads us to suspect that's what they're looking at. They have a funding deal that covers up to the end of next financial year, so they know what they're playing with. Um, so I'd expect the TfL formula funding to be similar to this year, all being well. Um, we have done quite well in attracting what TfL called discretionary funding, funding we compete for. So the cycle network development schemes, Greenwich Town Centre, Liverpool Neighbourhood, um, and some other things that have completely gone from my mind have all been secured. Uh, additional cycle training, um, we've secured more than the London norm on those, and I think we're doing quite well. Um, so we'd like to try and keep that going to keep that edge. Um, yeah, that's where we are for next year. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and then you've, uh, the other area I wanted to ask around were the school streets, and you've already mentioned that, Avril. The last time I think you came and spoke about the transport strategy, you mentioned, as you have now, that this is a priority. So I just wanted to get a clearer idea. On page 59, you talk about school streets and um, consultation and work, but I think when you came last time, you said that the idea was to have school streets on all of the streets across the borough, and that was the holistic vision you were taking forward. So how far are we on that vision, and is that still the plan? That's where we are thus far. Um, and again, dependent on funding, we hope we can keep up the momentum and continue on that journey. We cannot possibly do it all um, in one year because it's, it's, it's very time consuming. Another thing we do is we work with the schools with their own travel plan as well, when we're, so that it's an internal mm -hmm external exercise. Um, it's our way of saying um, we will help you with the um, roads. If you do some uh, travel training, we also do cycle um, training to the kids, for the kids. So it's working all of that together. Um, so the capacity to do too many at one time is challenging. So we're hoping to do as many next year and the year after, etc. funding willing. Just going to add, in case my update was confusing, there's two lines that relate to school streets because this has come out of a spreadsheet and I've failed to account for humans reading it. Um, there's the making permanent of the existing school streets and the upgrading of those, and then there's the prioritisation of traffic management and school streets, which is in a separate box somewhere, which looks at that wider vision. So definitely ongoing. Sorry if it was confusing. So can you just remind me how many schools we have in the borough? And so how many is that of the 11? Uh, 52 primary schools, which is what we look at mainly for school streets. Okay, so the idea is still to, to look at something across those 52 schools within this transport strategy? All of the ones that, to look at them all and see, cover as many as is appropriate. Some of them, you know, are on... The, on really major routes, we wouldn't be possible to, you know, close into traffic as a school street, but we'll, you know, we'll take those as different categories and look at what can be done everywhere. Um, can I carry on? So just um, on the EV charging, you say that you're looking at um, proposals 
Are you able to go a little bit further on that? We get a lot of queries from residents about EV charging not being, not meeting demand. Um, lots of residents doing very dangerous things with charging. So I think the sooner we can provide clarity on what's happening in this area and how we're overhauling this whole si situation would be great. Councillor Hannan, if I could just add a supplementary to that, if you don't mind. Uh, yeah, as part of your answer, Ryan, for the sake of expediency, uh, if you wouldn't mind explaining, I'll provide some detail around what is an innovative licensing approach to create a step change in EV charging provision. Uh, was there anything else anyone wanted to add to that particular item? Councillor Asgar. Hi, thank you. It's, um, it's just a decision this year. Um, we're in December, so... Um, Presumably it's in the new year, or is it before the end of this year? Three for the price of one. I could try and do four, but we're probably safer with three. Um, so the EV action plan sets out that we want to look at an approach that allows providers to come in, have more competition, and a licensing type approach. We've been doing work to understand how that would work technically, and we're putting together a decision paper. It's in the final stages of um, ironing out procurement and legal questions, which jumps forward to the third question, actually, that if we can get those resolved, it could be soon. If they take a little longer, it may end up going into the new year. Um, but the, I suppose what the step change means, and without trying to prejudge what's in the decision paper, my without getting my legal and procurement colleagues jumping on me for getting something wrong. What's in the strategy is an approach that would allow providers to apply for licenses um, to provide a large number of charges over a period. They would pay a fee. We'd have criteria for where those go to make sure they're appropriate. Um, and we'd want to propose different methods for controlling that, making sure it works. But it would allow a lot more providers to come in, more competition for the market, and crucially, the EV action plan sets out it's a very immature market and there's a big risk to selecting one provider, as some boroughs have done, and then that provider has just been swelling their numbers to sell themselves off at a higher value um, to another provider and the service isn't great. So what we're trying to do is make sure we get a step change, but a really good quality step change that's durable and evolves durable and evolves, that, you know, the benefits last and it evolves as the technology does very quickly. Um, I think that was all three. I think so. Councillor Hartley. So while we're on EV, could I throw in my fourth one? Thank you. Um, about at-home charging, which is something I've raised with the Cabinet member, and we had a really fantastic scrutiny session on the carbon neutral plan, and one of the recommendations we made was just to make sure that we're exploring at-home charging in a big way um, and the London Borough of Bromley which is something I've raised before have got uh, I understand this pilot where you can have at-home charging underneath the pavement from your you know if you don't have a driveway obviously which obviously the vast majority of people don't um, and that is I understand a really uh, a fruitful pilot that actually could really expand capacity for charging for um, uh, homeowners uh, and and uh, people who want to charge off on the street. Um, so uh, have you spoken to London Borough of Bromley about that? Um, and if, can you give us an update if you have? Um, we're watching, there's a number of pilots of gully type technologies, uh, Bromley, Oxfordshire, and a couple of other smaller ones. Um, and we'll watch that alongside this decision. Um, I don't think it would ever replace kind of our proposals for charge points. Um, they've got an obvious appeal and a benefit. The, I think the issue we foresee is that the areas where they'll be most in demand is where you are least able to guarantee that you can park outside your bit of gully. Um, so the, you know, if you think a busy terraced street where people don't have off-street parking, equally, if like me, if I get to park within 500 metres of my house I've done well, let alone at my specific gully point. So there's a number of difficulties there which I think might make it less applicable here than in, uh, say, Oxfordshire or parts of Bromley. But we're watching very closely. We're just aware of 
issues. So can I make a plea as a, a, one of the two councillors here who represents a ward that is in so many respects practically a part of Bromley, I mean in the, term, in the way that people live, you know, honestly, um, this is a very different ward, with a point we're always making to the rest of the borough. And I agree, you know, I can see the case is a lot stronger in Bromley, um, but a lot of our residents actually do have access. And uh, to further Councillor Dowse's point, where uh, that it's harder to achieve modal shift in our ward because people have to, uh, you know, are so much more reliant on cars. Um, like Thamesmead, in fact, as well, is another example of that. Um, where it, modal shift is harder because um, people, uh, by virtue of lack of public transport in particular, don't have any alternative. It could be a really good part of the mix to introduce at-home charging because that would get more of our residents um, uh, given the facility to uh, switch to EV, which is a good outcome for everybody. So could I make a plea that it's firmly in the mix for the south of the borough um, recognising the particular characteristics of Mottingham, Cold Harbour and New Elton Ward? Uh, yes, and I have to say part of the approach is because there are very different areas of the borough that need very different solutions. Um, and I think the licensing approach would allow that, but tacking on kind of gully type at home as well. Um, I just want oh. to add that... Thank you. Um, Members have raised this issue with me, and I'm not averse. I mean, I think the, um, my, my officers are a lot more risk conscious, and I'm not saying I want to take risks, but we are looking at it. <coughs> Sorry. I, you know, I've, 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 I've kind of committed to take a look at it. Thank you. Having everyone jumped in on your question, Councillor Hannan, uh, if you've got any follow-ups that you'd like to ask or other questions, please go ahead. That's fine. It's more efficient that way. Just one final question on Dockless Bikes on page 60. Um, obviously, this has raised a lot of uh, debate, shall we say, um, between residents and us and, and within members. Um, and you say that there's a member workshop planned in December. Do you mean this month? Have I missed it? Yes, it was last week. A week before last. Happy to catch up separately, though. Okay, so yeah, I, I know about the EV one. So the idea is then that you will then take the feedback from that and pull together proposals. Okay, I'll get up to date. Thank you, Councillor Asghar. Thank you. I'll try and be as quick fire as I can because it's quarter past nine. Um, 20 miles per hour roads, um, it refers to um, delivering them by zone, uh, circa two per year. Can you tell me how big those zones are? And also, um, with a sort of aspiration to have a 20 mile per hour borough, are any roads going to be exempt and remain 30 miles per hour, like major trunk roads, dual carriageways and such? Thank you. So the size of the zones varies. Um, Trying to think of a typical. Hmm. Usually boundary road to boundary road. Yeah, they're normally cells between a set of major roads um, that give us a reasonable scale. In terms of which, you know, if the roads that would be excluded, I suppose we're thinking of the roads we manage. So some of the Transport for London roads they manage, although they've started to reduce speeds on some of those. I think what we'll need to do is assess how far some roads can be taken down, and it might be that some need a reduction in speed from their current limit, but not quite to 20. Um, if you've got a very wide 20, uh, dual carriageway with lots of space and people aren't going to adhere to a 20 and we can't enforce it, it might not be the right thing. Um, so I think we'll need to look at those more strategic roads, roads individually. And we'll also be looking very carefully at how the ones TfL have already done, such as the South Circular, how they're working. Thank you. Uh, next question is on the highways contract. Um, it says the decision to award the contract is anticipated in January. 
Can you tell me how long this contract is for? Um, <clears throat> is it with the current provider and also have any insourcing options been explored or can they be? Thank you. Sorry, can you just repeat the last bit of us? Insourcing. I wish I hadn't heard that one. Um, so it's a comp competitive tender currently, which went out to open market. Um, and it's been um, a bit of a ride over the last 18 months, couple of years. Um, it's the first time we've been out competitively in over 10 years. Um, and the proposed contract duration will be five plus three year extensions. Um, so we've, we've finished the, um, no, actually Monday, the evaluation starts um, internally by officers. So all, we had a clarification request period um, for all of the contractors to put all their questions in and all of the documents that were uploaded on the council's procurement site. Uh, officers are ready to, to go through all that and we've actually got an external consultant supporting us on the pricing modelling. Um, so, yeah, I'm, obviously it's, it's a mature market in, in terms of uh, borough-wide. There's 32 London boroughs and TfL have their, they're the 30, they have a low-hat contract in place as well. But typically, there's sort of four or five players, I would say. Um, uh, and yeah, in sourcing in the current climate, considering that we did a direct award to us, wasn't an option that we considered to be um, possible. Thank you. <clears throat> so there's no possibility of looking at insourcing for five years, is that correct? I think the business case and, and the, the procurement um, route that we have chosen needs to align pretty much with the whole of London. And I'm not aware of many boroughs that have insourced um, direct labour undertaking highway repairs and um, road improvement delivery. Thank you. But there are many councils in other parts of the country that that do do it it's not it, uh, but you're saying no, no one in London has in sourced road maintenance there, there may well be some councils that have very minor make safe repairs um, that are carried out internally but um, I think Kingston for a period of time had in source labor um, but there's not many Okay, thank you. I'm going to go a bit rogue and ask about something that's not in the update, but it was in the last update. Um, <clears throat> I just wondered how um, the um, assessment of uh, pavement parking was going. Um, so do forgive me, indulge me. I know it's not in this um, report, but it is a big issue in my ward. Thank you. So we, I haven't got the exact numbers in my head, although I've received a lot of casework on it and the team have readily responded. But at one point, I think we had over 300 roads and that's been brought down to about 120 roads um, so where we've eliminated footway parking. And admittedly, um, the list was probably not quite as up to date as we'd have liked. And actually quite a few changes had happened um, and, and the list wasn't really being managed accordingly. So we, we eliminated a lot of those. We dealt with um, a percentage of those roads in the recent CPZ that we delivered. Uh, and our proposal going, going forward is to use a resource that we currently got um, and obviously eliminate those roads as we move forward with our CPZ. But we'll also have um, ad hoc schemes that we'll be bringing forward. So it's a, a dedicated um, program that I've I've moved into the parking design team um, and there is dedicated, not necessarily a dedicated officer, but there is someone accountable for it, um, along with a lot of other sort of minor scheme work. That's great, thank you. Can I just clarify when you say you've gone down from 300 roads to 120 roads, is that where it was happening or where it was permitted? Thanks. So where it was 
permitted uh, and where we haven't necessarily got a solution to remove and find an alternative approach to that. Thank you. And my final question is I'm delighted to see that uh, we're now working with TfL to develop a strategy for better bus services across Royal Greenwich. I know funding is an issue with TfL, but um, this is a very positive step forward. Um, I myself have been liaising with TfL on um, diverting one of our local bus routes in Plumstead Common to pick up at the Elizabeth Line, which you know about. Um, so what's the, I know what the aspiration is, but what's actually the reality of that? Are we going to draw up a, a, a sort of wish list with TfL and then be told there's no money? Um, thanks. I think from my point of view, we need to be clear about what, where we need to see improvements. Um, and there's been various ways that we've tried to reach out to them and we had a conversation only a couple of weeks ago about possibly speaking to the mayor. We, you know, we've got a meeting with the deputy mayor in a couple of weeks about a separate issue. Um, but we're probably, I think we're second fastest borough in terms of growth. Charlton Riverside, we've got Thamesmead, um, parts of Woolwich as well. And what I feel is that TfL have been very much focused on bus journey times and they've been focused on prioritising bus and it may, you know, having improvements as such. Um, but I don't feel certain parts of TfL uh, and ourselves really are talking, especially around bus planning, future growth, um, night dragon developments down in, in, in Greenwich. Um, and we've got close links with obviously our um, planning colleagues and, and members that are part of that board as well. And we were talking a couple of weeks ago about how we can sort of present that to them whether or not it's looking at whether bus routes can be diverted and where new bus routes are going to be needed and when they're going to be needed. But of course, TfL are uh, in a similar place that we are in terms of budget constraints. So I think it's about us understanding ourselves where the growth's going to be, where we're going to need those extra services uh, and where the demand will be. And it'll be up for them to tell us realistically um, whether or not it's achievable. There's a London plan um, and there's the Mayor's Transport Strategy. We've reviewed both of those documents and, you know, we talked earlier about south of the borough. Um, this document was, I think, especially the Mayor's Transport Strategy was written in 2018. At that time, there was aspiration to have cross-river ferries uh, from this side of the water over to the peninsula. There were aspirations to potentially look at a Bakerloo line south of the borough, look at a DLR, um, and, you know, We've, we've lobbied TfL and we've moved back and asked those questions, really are those dead in the water? Are they some, you know, things that they want to look at? Um, they're still on the table, but are they five years away, six years away? Um, but we, we must say, you know, I don't want to start bashing TfL. Um, what we've seen in terms of uh, their engagement on the DLR in Thamesmead and the recent announcement in terms of um, obviously the autumn statement and everything like that, they've worked tirelessly with us to ensure that you know there is some unlocking of new public infrastructure and obviously we had the elizabeth line as well so um i just want to position the same as 20 mile an hour we want to know where we're going but we've not been able to do everything at once um 18 months you know in terms of my journey councillor cow similar highways contracts 20 mile an hour we want to be clear on the future of those we want to be clear about I, I receive, and the, the, the department receives so much casework, and we had residents here earlier talking about an LTN. Um, we have residents all over the bar asking for lots of things, um, and we need to prioritise and, and make sure that we use our funded accordingly, and I'm sure TfL will be exactly the same. Thank you. Councillor Hartley. Thank you, Chair. I'll rearrange things, because I had a question on buses, which follows neatly from uh, Councillor Asgars. Um, so when we had TfL um, representative six-ish months ago, um, he talked about the bus review, the strategic bus review for Greenwich, but he didn't attach a timetable and sort of wouldn't and couldn't. <laughs> I don't mind bashing TfL, by the way, um, uh, but I understand you can't. Um, so uh, could you just clarify for us what exactly, when will the strategic bus review take place? Uh, that's kind of one, one thing. 
And could we um, make a big push for the X161, which is something we've um, we've kind of lobbied for. There's been cross-party motions from memory that we've passed. Um, so that would be a service that would link uh, Mottingham and Eltham all the way through to the Elizabeth Line and bring the benefits of the Elizabeth Line to the sat very south of Dora. Um Could we add that to the, to the list for the strategic review? And then kind of final part of it is, will the Eltham to Beckton Silvertown bus link, the missing link that was promised and not delivered by Transport for London, is that on the table as part of the strategic bus review, or is the Silvertown bus uh, question separate? No, um, so in terms of a strategic bus review, I think the discussions we've been having with TfL since their changes is looking at a number of different approaches, and it's partly building on the not coming up with a strategy and having no funding at the end of it and sort of following the funding a little bit. And as Ryan says, you've got some that will be led by big development, so bus rapid transit to Thamesmead. Um, some that might be led by being just good efficiency improvements that make their services work better and improve patronage. So I think Woolwich Town Centre could be a good version of that. It's probably based on a gradual evolution from when there were buses and a Royal Arsenal and no DLR. And it's, you know, it needs a rethink and it could be a win for everyone, particularly if you've got BRT coming in. Um, so what we're looking at is a number of different themes. And one of those is the connectivity, north, south, north, east, however you want to describe that. Um, so it's definitely in there, um, but it'll probably be a number of different themes coming together, coming forward separately. Um, in terms of Silvertown, um, the yeah, I think their network for that is is kind of set in their proposals, um, and I think we'd need to look around, seeing if it works, and I suppose pick up other connections separately. I think. Okay, thanks. So that's not in scope of the TfL's bus review for the borough, um, and and timings. Do we know when that strategic review that that bus re route review is taking place? No, and I think at this stage it's working out what all those elements are, and they'll probably have quite different timescales. Um, so I wouldn't, you know, there are some bits that I think could be relatively quick, some bits that are, are a much more strategic, longer term review. Um, I think we managed to have the meeting with the new person in the summer, and we're kind of working with her teams to flesh that out. Um, so I don't have kind of timescales yet. Okay, thanks. And thanks for confirming that, obviously, north-south links in general, if I can make a specific plug for X161, because I think the lever there is the Elizabeth Line. You know, we've got such a strong argument there to bring the benefits of the Elizabeth Line to the south of the borough. And I'm led to believe from a, a colleague of mine on the London Assembly um, who told me that uh, there's some sort of resistance within TfL to express bus routes based on some experiences elsewhere. So... Basically, what I'm saying is, if we're not making the case for the X161 as the council, I don't think it's, and, and, you know, anybody else is going to make that case. So, thank you. If you just sort of take that away, thank you. Um, and so, that's buses, trains. Um, totally agree with what Councillor Dow said. Um, you'll know we had uh, the Save the Loop petition that I started, two and a half thousand people signed that, and we've now got um, uh, three loop services in the mornings going from um, Mottingham and New Eltham to Abbey Wood and two in the evenings, but none coming back the other way. So it's not, a, it, the loop services, it has, you know, we've won some services back, which is great. Uh, and Steve White, I, I ran into him at Cannon Street and his face sort of fell when he realized who was marching towards him to, to bang on about a loop train. Um, but, you know, uh, you know, and to be fair, they have brought back some of those services, but it's not a viable commuting route. And when we're talking about north-south transport links, it's kind of a circuitous north-south link that's so important. So um, could you maybe just give us an update on your engagement with Southeastern uh, Avril generally, but also can you really make sure the loop service is part of what you're pushing for as well? I can, um, and I, I will continue to try and do that, but I have to say that Southeastern, you know, uh, I think my last letter um, took about six months to get a response. So I'm just trying to give you a flavor of speed is not their virtue. So, but it's not for want of trying on my part um, and the teams. 
Yes, and uh, uh, presumably they'll be coming to scrutiny as well. Yes, we're, we're I relishing think the chance. They are actually, um, the other day they were making approaches that they wanted to, to, to talk with us. So um, I will use that opportunity to... Thank you, it's appreciated. Okay, that's buses, trains. I've got a couple of questions on the prioritisation study, a couple on parking, which we haven't really got to, and one on resourcing, but I will try and be quick, Chair. Um, on the prioritisation um, study, I'm kind of reluctant to kind of nudge us back in towards traffic management, but this is about the, the study and the research. It says here um, that uh, you hope to be able to share results from the prioritization matrix study at the end of the financial year, but we've heard January. Um, could you just clarify the timing? January, um, um, I've, I've said I need it done by January. Um, I've also asked <coughs> um, uh, colleagues, to, um, uh, Councillor Williams, to cast her eyes on it um, so that I'm having a different set, because I do believe that Sometimes I could be influenced by, you know, all the school streets, the this, and crossing. So I have asked another um, councillor to just look at it with um, officers before I um, approve it, and it goes to, 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 it will be published. I think I said this to you at um, full council just yesterday. I just wanted to um, clarify the, 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 the difference in the two answers, but uh, you've okay, made that okay. very clear. I've, I've said um, end of January, and um, you know, if it's not done then, um, you'd have every reason to be chasing. Thanks for being very clear on that, thank you. Um, and on timescales, you know, um, so the ward council is in Mottingham, Cold Avenue, Eltham, are working with the cabinet member on two issues in particular, West Hallows and Larchwood, and Ryan, you know, we've met about this several times. Um, there's, a, there's frustrations, as you know, from residents in both of those examples. I know there's frustrations everywhere, but something that um, uh, is really at the source of a lot of that is just a lack of clarity on when they will find, when residents will find out what the plan is or isn't, you know, whatever the outcome of the decision making is. So be, my question is, beyond January, could we have a really clear timetable for when each area prioritised and not prioritised, you know, when that will be communicated to residents, when uh, any work will start, because I think it, that will help, um, even if it doesn't give people the answers they necessarily want in all cases, of course it won't. Um, I think clarity on timetable is, is really missing. I do understand what you're saying, and I, I would say to you, sometimes you could be um, hostage to fortune once you start putting dates down, because things change, um, and pressures, and the team gets pulled in another direction for something. But as far as it's possible, I will be able to give some general terms. You know, we had, for example, this year, all the um, work we wanted to do on CPZs. Um, but we were doing a lot of stuff um, in uh, West and East Greenwich and so on and so forth. So there's many things we were doing. So we found that it took a little bit longer than the time scale we'd um, initially anticipated. I think we were over eager. Um, so that's why I'm a little bit, I would, I would put it in rough terms rather than um, precise terms. Okay, thank you. Well, even rough terms would, would go some way to, to addressing the frustration. Thank you. And that brings me on to the next question I had, or another question I had, which was about resourcing. So there's been a lot of churn in the team on uh, head of highways. We've had a lot of movement in that role. Um, and uh, I just wondered if the cabinet member might update on, on resourcing in the team and uh, uh, any challenges remaining there. Um, yes, it, you know, losing a uh, head of highways was um, regrettable. He, he's, you know, very good at his job, um, but he was interim. Um, I need to just make that point. And um, the, we've just completed the restructuring of the department. Um, when I came in and um, it moved to sit under Mersad, um, one of the first things that um, I was told was we will need to stabilize the department. 
um, a lot of those heads of department were interim, am I right or wrong? Um, we, uh, Ryan was relatively new to, 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 to the role of assistant director. So we needed to stabilize the, um, the workforce in the department. Um, we've done that. Um, we've now completed the restructuring. I think Ryan's been working on that. For, and so it's out now to consultation, consultation yeah, so with, with members. So, you know, I'm expecting from next year, and some of the positions have already been interviewed, I believe. So we will be starting to fill those in. Okay, thank you for the update. Um, and then a couple of questions on parking. So um, there's a list of CPZs and their status is here. Um, could I ask about the impact of uh, the pro a general question about the impact on schools? And um, the reason I ask this is sort of coincidentally to this meeting just today, a few hours ago. So that's the reason that there isn't a heads up. I won't say which school because I don't have permission to, um, but it does raise a really important point. So this is in relation to um, the Charlton CPZ. Um, I've been uh, had a message passed on from a governor at a primary school. Um, and 40% of staff at that school um, can't use public transport to get to work. And they're very worried about the impact of the extension of that particular CPZ. And I'm not asking about the specifics, but as a policy point, how, do, how does the council, when it's developing CPZ schemes, um, check and consider adverse impacts on schools um, and the ability of teachers to get to work? Um, I think Sorry, if you don't mind me just jumping on that as well. Uh, possibly even the same school. Um, yes, so if you could add to Councillor Harley's answer uh, what level of support we provide to help schools negotiate this. I'm aware that we have a large number of schools within controlled parking zones. So what level of support have we historically provided those schools to overcome that issue? Um, I think, to be honest, we don't. We have quite a few CPZs, especially you know about thirty percent of the boroughs within the CPZ. Um, we don't per se provide any support or any exemptions necessarily for schools, um, and you know we've gone through two cycles of consultation, um, and most recently, really only restarted the CPZ program. I would say over the last eighteen months, um, and typically. We don't hear a lot from schools, um, despite reaching out and despite re uh, having two sets of uh, um, consultation stages, especially on the Charlton CPZ. Um, I wouldn't say that that we, that we were contacted by any particular school. We'd be happy to obviously talk about arrangements. But generally, um, I think looking around the borough at other schools that are currently in the CPZ and, and, and seeing how they work um, and how they operate, there are bus routes, obviously, and, and, a, and a main rail station. I appreciate that we all have to travel to work somehow, um, but there isn't a solution, per se, and, and Greenwich is a bit of an outlier in terms of the way we operate, and there's a lot of other boroughs in London that are heavily populated with CPZ. So um, we spoke earlier about lessons learnt. Um, on, on all particular schemes uh, and my aim this year is to look back at all of the things that we are proposing to deliver and what we have delivered and look at our comms um, and our plan moving forward to try and eliminate some of those issues that arise but I would be particularly interested in hearing on the details of that if that's okay. Thank you Chair. No, 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 no. I, as I said, I'm not, I'm not naming the school because I don't have permission to do so um, from the correspondent. Um, but um, I'll absolutely share it, and it's only just come in today. I would have shared it in advance. Um, so um, I, I wonder whether we might throw that into the mix for recommendations as well, Chair. Um, I just think that issue needs to be looked at um, because, you know, in, in, in the message uh, that I have here, 40% uh, of staff can't use public transport, feel they can't use public transport to get to work. And even if they could get business permits, which they can't because it's not an eligible business, that would be £445. So even if they were eligible, that's a lot of money for a teacher to stump up if they do need to, uh, to travel by car to get to, to uh, work in a school. And I, I could I suggest that we make a recommendation 
that we ask the cabinet member or officers to to look at how we can support schools to mitigate the impact of CPZs on teachers and staff. Thank you. Uh, are the rest of the panel amenable to including that as a recommendation? Yeah, I see nods all round. Uh, would you be able to just note that, Samantha? Thank you. Were there any further questions you had, Councillor Hartley? Thank you. Yes, just one more. Thank you. Um, it, it's um, it's another Charlton question. It, it, it's it's not a it's not on purpose, <laughs> Chair. I know obviously it's your area, but it, it's actually it's about Charlton Athletic, and it's got a much broader implication for for um, uh, for the borough. So could I just ask um, the the uh, change to match day uh, parking restrictions? Could you just explain what engagement you've had, the council has had with Charlton Athletic and with the supporters trust uh, supporters club? Um, because there's a lot of concern about um, the impact of those match day changes. Could you just explain to us how you've engaged, I guess is the question. So there was a little bit of confusion because there was the initial Charlton CPZ that was consulted on and actually feedback, those who feel like we don't look at it. Um, we engaged with all members. It was actually a proposal that was born out of the consultation to, you know, residents felt that we needed to look at match day um, restrictions. Subsequently, we then reached out to Charlton Athletic themselves um, and had a couple of rounds of engagement with them. Um, and actually, the CEO and, and chairman reached out to Councillor Cow during the consultation period as well um, to have a standalone meeting with us um, to raise their concerns. Um, and although typically, you know, we would uh, make a decision uh, based on significant and material objections, so to speak, we have had quite a response from the Supporters Trust and we've had um, response directly from Charlton Athletic, which we will need to consider uh, in our decision-making process. So typically we would move forward with the making of a traffic order once it's been advertised. Um, but due to the level of um, feedback we've had on it, we will be referring it to the cabinet member at some point. But we've, you know, it's in the round of all the other things that we've got going on in terms of decisions. So the likelihood is we'll look at that um, in the new year. Um, so we've collated all of that. Okay, thanks, that's helpful. Um, have you met with the Supporters Trust? There was somebody from the Supporters Trust in so the meeting we had. We had, uh, we had predominantly Charlton Athletic, we had comms, um, and they were liaising and, uh, with the Supporters Trust, and they actually informed us that they were directly going to contact us with their um, proposals, with their issues. So, it, you know, it's not out of the question yet, a decision's not been made in there. You know, it's a possibility that we're happy um, to, to meet with those. If there's anything new that we feel is not in writing, but I think they've made it pretty clear what their issues are. And I okay. still have a letter in my inbox um, inviting me to have some further discussions with them. So this is an ongoing discussion. Okay, that's good to hear. And not to make everything about loop trains, Chair. Um, a lot of the two and a half, a lot of the two and a half thousand people who signed the, the, my Save the Loop petition were Charlton fans, um, not just in Greenwich but across South East London. The loop train was a great way of um, of getting to the valley. So um, it, the loss of that has made it harder in these circumstances to introduce those match day restrictions. But I'm pleased to hear that um, that engagement is is underway. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Hartley. Councillor Hannan, you had a follow-up. I just wanted to ask a question about cycle hangers, which isn't in your report this time, but I know we discussed it the, the last time. And at that time, you said that although there is a high demand for cycle hangers, um, that because of budget restrictions, there was no immediate plan to significantly increase funding or focus on that. But my point at the time was that with a with the transport strategy where we're trying to encourage people to walk and cycle if we're not providing the means for them to keep cycles in a secure place then we're not going to increase ownership and use of cycles so just going forward now given where we are with the transport strategy and as you're looking at the next financial year and the proposals for that are you thinking any differently about investment in cycle hangers and I think also there was a question that I posed um, through member services about whether if we get interest from uh, the private sector to fund cycle hangers, whether we would have the capacity as a council to um, absorb that funding or to bring those cycle hangers within our network of operation. And I think we're talking to a developer in our ward who has 
said that they would be interested in supporting cycle hangers as part of that development. Um, so we've got an aspiration to increase uh, cycle parking by 300% as per the carbon neutral plan, the transport strategy. Uh, uh, main base funding is received from Transport for London on an annual basis that, that we bid for as part of our local implementation plan. And we're actually in a round of funding, internal council funding, where we're at the, comp you know, within competition with other parts of the, um, the council and, you know, adults, health, um, you know, lots of other places where we're proposing um, to have some extra funding for increasing cycle parking. We will utilise any um, developments coming forward to enable some infrastructure improvements. And we're also looking into if there's any specific um, Section 106 funding with developer contributions um, to enable that increase. But typically, um, we are, you know, working on a stakeholder approach at the moment but with that um, injection of funding, that would enable us to sort of be able to take a bit of a view of build it and they will come approach. It. Whereas at the moment we're dealing with um, reactionary um, installation. Um, so to answer your question, yes, we would be utilizing developers and we will be hoping to have some extra funding internally, but that round of funding will probably look to be February um, and I have to stress we'll be in competition with other parts of the council who have got similar policies to improve uh, the way that the council works. Um, and we're also going through quite a few budget pressures at the moment. So I can't give you um, any clue as to what the outcome will be, but it is our aspiration to have that in place um, for the new financial year. Okay, great, thank you. So are you saying 300% increase for the next financial year? No overall okay and so just to clarify that if a developer is saying to us that they're willing to fund a cycle hanger as part of their proposal but on on the public for the public um we can absorb that and work with them okay great thank you thank you. that they would have to liaise with the department because yeah. you know obviously anything going on the public highway okay Councillor Dowers. Sorry, I'm really just looking for you to put my mind at rest on this one. The emissions-based parking charges. I've had a lot of uh, messages from residents asking why, you know, why it's gone up so much and all, all the rest. Of it. I'm assuming that we sent out um, information before the charges. How how did we um, how did we communicate with? people about this increase well some people's increase um casting my mind back a little bit now my alarm's going off that's usually when i fall asleep putting the kids to bed and then have to get up and go downstairs do their lunch so apologies um yeah casting my mind back so we went live in the summer and i think we probably started around january um posting quite a bit on our social media platforms and we did a piece in greenwich info as well so obviously we you know it wasn't possible to do individual letter drops as such but there was um comms and pamphlets that went out to our libraries as well um so I, no, I don't recall but in within greenwich info the, the the details went out in that uh, as well which everyone would have received so um we did a, a spread on that say that when it went live there was a huge um, take up um, which suggests people were aware um, I've, I've got the figures in my office but it, it really rocketed and also I think um, the other thing that's important to say because I get casework coming from you know all over the borough but I think the number of um, high polluting cars in the borough is very low. It's much lower than people assume. And I think partly to do with the ULES, um, most of the cars kind of hit the middle ground. Um, so a lot of those that are complaining a lot are those that have the highest polluting cars. Thank you. 
Councillor Hartley. Thank you, Chair. I mean, it's really not just the people with the highest polluting cars who are feeling the impact on of, of uh, the emissions-based parking charges. I just wanted to uh, correct that. Um, but uh, Councillor Daz's question has prompted me. Um, the, the part of the issue was the... Can I just, can I just um, clarify that? I'm not saying people don't feel any impact on anything. You know, any charge or any expenditure to anyone, especially in this cost of living crisis, people do feel the impact. But what I'm saying is those who feel the most impact um, or, or who are feeling it most are those with the highest polluting cars. A, the, a large majority has actually had a reduction in their parking. And my question was on, uh, that some of those, um, uh, something I've raised before, because of the mismatch in the emissions-based charging thresholds criteria, but the mismatch between that and the ULES standard, is that some of those people that you mention have cars that are compliant with ULES but are being penalised under emission, emissions-based parking. And that, that uh, gives rise to a sense of significant unfairness. You know, the comment I have had is, well, if it's good enough for Sadiq, why isn't it good enough for Greenwich? And that sort of thing. So um, could, I know that there is a technical reason about the DVLA and data for this, I think I'm right in saying. But last time we spoke about it, I think it was going to be looked into and whether there's anything we can do to, to ameliorate the the mismatch in, in criteria. So a technical question, but could be an important one, I think. Um, can I just say that is the, the criteria we used for the um, emissions-based charging is what's used in many boroughs. Mm -hmm. It's not something that was, many London boroughs, it's not something that was just created in Greenwich. I think it's mapped to DVLA thresholds, that's what I mean. I'm, I totally acknowledge that, but the problem is it's mismatched with ULES. So, uh, that's the, the issue. And I, I, I'm not saying it's even a specifically a Greenwich problem, but is it something we can look at? Because it, yeah, I think it, I understand why people feel aggrieved about that. If Councillor Hartley will ask me to add a clarification question around that, I think what we're asking is, so the car vehicle excise duty thresholds are what we're mapping our emissions based charging to. So, uh, whereas the, and, and please clarify this, I'm not sure, I, it's just I think this is the question. Uh, whereas the pollution is linked to the Euro 5, 6, or 7, whatever emission standard, which is NOx and particulates, is, is that the understanding? I, I think that's what you're trying to get at, Councillor Harley. Your technical knowledge is greater than mine, as always, Chair, but um, the, the, it fundamentally, I think you're right about the first part, but fundamentally, whatever the, the thresholds that you les are based on don't line up perfect, don't align with the DVLA, um, you're right, VED thresholds. Um, and so some people, to, to make it real, tangible, some people are compliant with ULES, but are paying more under emissions-based parking. I think the technical explanation was right that the two things are set on slightly different things. Um, I think there's a logic for that in that the ULES is a single threshold um, prescribed for air quality reasons. Um, the emissions-based charging, you know, obviously wanted a range of things, which is you wouldn't be able to achieve with Euro standards, really, or without confusing even the real geeks among us. Um, me really um, but yeah it wouldn't be possible with euro standards so you would have to use the different systems for the two different things and there's also the fact that the borough has a very ambitious carbon neutral plan target to hit 2030 which is faster than the mayor's target so you know there's there's different objectives there as well thank you did you have a follow-up councillor hartley no great thank you uh, any questions from the rest of the panel right so i've got a few uh not many. Uh, one of them is actually a suggestion and a request, and I'll go with that first. So thank you for the report, and I'd really like to commend you on the progress that you've achieved over the last year. It really is quite impressive, considering that this transport strategy is less than a year old, or just on a year old, to actually have be able to produce this much evidence of improvements that you've done is quite commendable, both the cabinet member and the officers within the various directorates. Um, 
One thing I wouldn't mind on future reports is uh, the mapping. Uh, you would have noticed members having to switch back and forth. So for instance, the question I'm about to ask, which is going to be around schools, uh, streets, you know, that's across two different pages and several items in between. So if we get a little bit more grouping on that, and if we could perhaps see a uh, better linkage to the five objectives that you've got up front, because you know this hits those objectives and it fulfills that, it would save us as members having to look at stuff and also help us communicate that better uh, to our residents. So that's a bit of a process issue. Um, my question is around the emissions-based parking charges again, uh, but specifically related to the CPZs that have already been consulted on. So where we've just completed a uh, consultation on the CPZ, i.e. in Charlton, uh, uh, how is that going to mesh with the emissions-based charging? Are those going to be applied or not? So any, any scheme that was consulted on before the emission-based charging was adopted will remain on the old pricing structure until the new renewal date. So when you say the renewal date, that means uh, in a CPZ that's about to be instituted, as I understand what you said, is that will remain for the period until a year's time. So it's a year away when they're renewing their permits. Is that correct? That's correct, yeah. Thank you for that clarification. Uh, my second question, and you'll be glad to hear my last, is the School Streets program. Uh, again, excellent work on completing the experimental school streets orders uh, but with that closing uh, where we had physical barriers in place previously as i understand it from the report we're now moving across to uh, automatic number plate recognition systems how far away are we from having that in place and what are schools doing in the interim uh, between the physical barriers and the installation of anpr systems so we're seeing a bit of a mixed bag, to be honest. Obviously, the schools have been very patient with us. Um, we've got, uh, I think, four schools that actually use volunteers, and we've got seven um, uh, in the rounds. We've actually made some permanent previously that have got hard closures in place, so they're still operating. But we've seen quite a few sites with maintenance issues, bollards being damaged, vandalised. Um, so we're sort of seeing a little bit of a dwindling presence on some of those um, hence the reason why we're really keen to sort of take the onus away from the operation um, to be on the school's shoulders and responsibilities by implementing those and obviously accompanying that will be some training and some uh, comms with the school and the school children as well about the sort of slight change of use of some of the areas as well so it's a bit, it's a bit mixed but most recently we heard from Deansfield School who were really chasing us about um, no, their volunteers being patient, but really want a solution to this. But again, it's been tricky fitting it all in with the programme. Um, we're the limited budgets available as well. We managed to source enough to be able to make those 11 permanent, but any future school streets are also in the round of, of bidding. So um, it's you know been on top of the agenda for a while, but it's been very difficult to get it over the line, but we're hopeful in the new financial year that will be possible. So again, when we say within the new financial year, are we saying that this change could be a year out or months out? I think there's been lots of questions on this casework. There was a full council question. We've said April, we're looking to implement them. We've, we've got a decision, it's on the forward plan. Um, we've got a decision that's hopeful to be made very soon. Um, there's we, about several decisions. Yeah, that so, yeah. Uh, great, thank you very much. That was the last of my questions. Do we have any other questions for any other panel members? No. Right, if you'll just bear with me a second, I just need to seek some guidance from Samantha on the last item. Thank you very much. I think that concludes item number six, and we've deferred item number seven. Chair, sorry, um, do, we, did we go, did I refresh my memory, I know we agreed the second recommendation I suggested about schools, did we agree the first one? Were people happy with the recommendation about a, a lessons learned exercise for the consultation process to protect the integrity of, the perceived integrity of the process? 
Yeah, thank you. I think we did. Uh, did we minute that as a recommendation, Samantha? Okay. Okay, so what we said, we'd take that at the end. Are people happy to take that as a recommendation as articulated by Councillor Hartley? Excellent, thank you very much. Those are our recommendations. In terms of future reports, uh, we have the annual transport scrutiny meeting coming up uh, in, February. in February. And uh, look forward to seeing that. I'd like to wish panel members yeah, a happy Christmas and a prosperous new year and a happy Hanukkah and basically compliments of the season. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you.